Section 28 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Second Memoir, Part 6. Property, once acquired by occupation and labor, it naturally preserves itself, not only by the same means, but also by the refusal of the holder to abdicate. For from the very fact that it has risen to the height of a right, it is its nature to perpetuate itself and to last for an indefinite period. Rights, considered from an ideal point of view, are imperishable and eternal, and time, which affects only the contingent, can no more disturb them than it can injure God himself. It is astonishing that our author, in speaking of the ideal, time, and eternity, did not work into his sentence the divine wings of Plato, so fashionable today in philosophical works. With the exception of falsehood, I hate nonsense more than anything else in the world. Property once acquired, good if it is acquired, but, as it is not acquired, it cannot be preserved. Rights are eternal. Yes, in the sight of God, like the archetypal ideas of the Platonists. But on the earth, rights exist only in the presence of a subject, an object, and a condition. Take away one of these three things, and rights no longer exist. Thus, individual possession ceases at the death of the subject, upon the destruction of the object, or in case of exchange or abandonment. Let us admit, however, with Monsieur Troplong, that property is an absolute and eternal right which cannot be destroyed save by the deed and at the will of the proprietor. What are the consequences which immediately follow from this position? To show the justice and utility of prescription, M. Trapelong supposes the case of a bona fide possessor whom a proprietor, long since forgotten or even unknown, is attempting to eject from his possession. At the start, the error of the possessor was excusable but not irreparable. Pursuing its course and growing old by degrees, it has so completely clothed itself in the colors of truth, it has spoken so loudly the language of right, it has involved so many confiding interests, that it fairly may be asked whether it would not cause greater confusion to go back to the reality than to sanction the fictions which it, an error without doubt, has sown on its way. Well, yes, it must be confessed without hesitation that the remedy would prove worse than the disease, and that its application would lead to the most outrageous injustice. How long since utility became a principle of law? When the Athenians, by the advice of Aristides, rejected a proposition eminently advantageous to the Republic, but also utterly unjust, they showed finer moral perception and greater clearness of intellect than Monsieur Troplong. Property is an eternal right, independent of time, indestructible except by the act and at the will of the proprietor. And here, this right is taken from the proprietor, and on what ground? Good God, on the ground of absence. Is it not true that legists are governed by caprice in giving and taking away rights? When it pleases these gentlemen, idleness, unworthiness, or absence can invalidate a right, which under quite similar circumstances, labor, residence, and virtue are inadequate to obtain. Do not be astonished that legists reject the absolute. Their good pleasure is law, and their disordered imaginations are the real cause of the evolutions in jurisprudence. If the nominal proprietor should plead ignorance, his claim would be none the more valid. Indeed, his ignorance might arise from inexcusable carelessness, etc. What? In order to legitimate dispossession through prescription, you suppose faults in the proprietor? you blame his absence which may have been involuntary his neglect not knowing what caused it his carelessness a gratuitous supposition of your own it is absurd one very simple observation suffices to annihilate this theory society which they tell us makes an exception in the interest of order in favor of the possessor as against the old proprietor owes the latter an indemnity since the privilege of prescription is nothing but expropriation for the sake of public utility but here is something stronger. In society, a place cannot remain vacant with impunity. A new man arises in place of the old one who disappears or goes away. He brings here his existence, becomes entirely absorbed, and devotes himself to this post which he finds abandoned. Shall the deserter then dispute the honor of the victory with the soldier who fights with the sweat standing on his brow and bears the burden of the day in behalf of a cause which he deems just? When the tongue of an advocate once gets in motion, 
who can tell where it will stop monsieur troplong admits and justifies usurpation in the case of absence of the proprietor and on a mere presumption of his carelessness but when the neglect is authenticated when the abandonment is solemnly and voluntarily set forth in a contract in the presence of a magistrate when the proprietor dares to say i cease to labor but i still claim a share of the product then the absentee's right of property is protected the usurpation of the possessor would be criminal farm rent is the reward of idleness where is i do not say the consistency but the honesty of this law prescription is a result of the civil law a creation of the legislator why has not the legislator fixed the conditions differently why instead of twenty and thirty years is not a single year sufficient to prescribe why are not voluntary absence and confessed idleness as good grounds for dispossession as involuntary absence ignorance or apathy but in vain should we ask monsieur Trapelong, the philosopher to tell us the ground of prescription concerning the code monsieur Trapelong does not reason the interpreter he says must take things as they are society as it exists laws as they are made that is the only sensible starting point well then write no more books cease to reproach your predecessors who like you have aimed only at interpretation of the law for having remained in the rear talk no more of philosophy and progress for the lie sticks in your throat monsieur troplong denies the reality of the right of possession he denies that possession has ever existed as a principle of society and he quotes monsieur de savigny who holds precisely the opposite opinion and whom he is content to leave unanswered at one time monsieur troplong asserts that possession and property are contemporaneous and that they exist at the same time which implies that the right of property is based on the fact of possession a conclusion which is evidently absurd at another he denies that possession had any historical existence prior to property an assertion which is contradicted by the customs of many nations which cultivate the land without appropriating it by the roman law which distinguished so clearly between possession and property and by our code itself which makes possession for twenty or thirty years the condition of property finally monsieur troplong goes so far as to maintain that the roman maxim nihil commun abet proprietas cum possessione which contains so striking an allusion to the possession of the agur publicus and which sooner or later will be again accepted without qualification expresses in french law only a judicial axiom a simple rule forbidding the union of an action possessoire with an action petitoire an opinion as retrogressive as it is unphilosophical in treating of actions possessoires monsieur trapelong is so unfortunate or awkward that he mutilates economy through failure to grasp its meaning just as property he writes gave rise to the action for revendication so possession the jus possessionis was the cause of possessory interdicts there were two kinds of interdicts the interdict recuperande possessionis and the interdict retenende possessionis which correspond to our complaint en caisse de cessan et nouvelete. There is also a third, a dipicende possessiones, of which the Roman law books speak in connection with the two others. But in reality, this interdict is not possessory, for he who wishes to acquire possessions by this means does not possess and has not possessed. And yet, acquired possession is the condition of possessory interdicts why is not an action to acquire possession equally conceivable with an action to be reinstated in possession when the roman plebeians demanded a division of the conquered territory when the proletaires of lyon took for their motto vivre en travaillant ou mourir en combattant to live working or die fighting when the most enlightened of the modern economists claim for every man the right to labor and to live they only propose this interdict a dipicende possessiones which embarrasses monsieur troplong so seriously and what is my object in pleading against property if not to obtain possession how is it that monsieur troplong the legist the orator the philosopher does not see that logically this interdict must be admitted since it is the necessary complement of the two others and the three united form an indivisible trinity to recover to maintain to acquire to break this series is to create a blank 
destroy the natural synthesis of things, and follow the example of the geometrician who tried to conceive of a solid with only two dimensions. But it is not astonishing that Monsieur Troplong rejects the third class of actions possessoires when we consider that he rejects possession itself. He is so completely controlled by his prejudices in this respect that he is unconsciously led, not to unite, that would be horrible in his eyes, but to identify the action possessoire with the action petitoire. This could be easily proved were it not too tedious to plunge into the metaphysical obscurities. As an interpreter of the law, Monsieur Troplong is no more successful than as a philosopher. One specimen of his skill in this direction, and I am done with him. Code of Civil Procedure, Article 23. Actions possessoires are only when commenced within the year of trouble by those who have held possession for at least a year by an irrevocable title. Monsieur Trapelong's Comments. Ought we to maintain, as Duparc, Pouillain, and Lanjunet would have us, the rule spoliatus ante omnia restituendus? When an individual who is neither proprietor nor annual possessor is expelled by a third party who has no right to the estate? I think not. Article 23 of the Code is general. It absolutely requires that the plaintiff in acciones possessoires shall have been in peaceable possession for a year at least. That is the invariable principle. It can in no case be modified. And why should it be set aside? The plaintiff had no saison, he had no privileged possession, he had only a temporary occupancy, insufficient to warrant in his favor the presumption of property, which renders the annual possession so valuable. Well, this a facto occupancy he has lost. Another is invested with it. Possession is in the hands of this newcomer. Now, is this not a case for the application of the principle in pari causa possessor poitois abetur should not the actual possessor be preferred to the evicted possessor can he not meet the complaint of his adversary by saying to him prove that you were an annual possessor before me for you are the plaintiff as far as i am concerned it is not for me to tell you how i possess nor how long i have possess possedeo quia possedeo i have no other reply no other defense when you have shown that your action is admissible then we will see whether you are entitled to lift the veil which hides the origin of my possession and this is what is honored with the name of jurisprudence and philosophy the restoration of force what when i have molded matter by my labor i quote monsieur Troplong, when i have deposited in it a portion of myself monsieur Troplong, when i have recreated it by my industry and set upon it the seal of my intelligence monsieur Troplong, on the ground that i have not possessed it for a year a stranger may dispossess me and the law offers me no protection and if monsieur Troplong is my judge monsieur Troplong will condemn me and if i resist my adversary if for this bit of mud which i may call my field and of which they wish to rob me a war breaks out between the two competitors the legislator will gravely wait until the stronger having killed the other has had possession for a year no no monsieur Troplong, you do not understand the words of the law for i prefer to call in question your intelligence rather than the justice of the legislature you are mistaken in your application of the principle in pari causa possessor potois abatur the actuality of possession here refers to him who possessed at the time when the difficulty arose not to him who possesses at the time of the complaint and when the code prohibits the reception of actions possessoires in cases where the possession is not of a year's duration it simply means that if before a year has elapsed the holder relinquishes possession and ceases actually to occupy in propria persona he cannot avail himself of an action possessoire against his successor in a word the code treats possession of less than a year as it ought to treat all possession however long it has existed that is the condition of property ought to be not merely saison for a year but perpetual saison i will not pursue this analysis farther when an author bases two volumes of quibbles on foundations so uncertain it may be boldly declared that his work whatever the amount of learning displayed in it is a mess of nonsense unworthy a critic's attention at this point sir i seem to hear you reproaching me for this conceited dogmatism this lawless arrogance which respects nothing claims a monopoly of justice and good sense and assumes to put in the pillory anyone who dares to maintain an opinion contrary to its own 
this fault they tell me more odious than any other in an author was too prominent a characteristic of my first memoir and i should do well to correct it it is important to the success of my defence that i should vindicate myself from this reproach and since while perceiving in myself other faults of a different character i still adhere in this particular to my disputatious style it is right that i should give my reasons for my conduct i act not from inclination but from necessity i say then that i treat my authors as i do for two reasons a reason of right and a reason of intention both peremptory one reason of right when i preach equality of fortunes i do not advance an opinion more or less probable a utopia more or less ingenious an idea conceived within my brain by means of imagination only i lay down an absolute truth concerning which hesitation is impossible modesty superfluous and doubt ridiculous but do you ask what assures me that that which i utter is true what assures me sir the logical and metaphysical processes which i use the correctness of which i have demonstrated by a priori reasoning the fact that i possess an infallible method of investigation and verification with which my authors are unacquainted and finally the fact that for all matters relating to property and justice i have found a formula which explains all legislative variations and furnishes a key for all problems now is there so much as a shadow of method in monsieur tollier monsieur trapelong and this swarm of insipid commentators almost as devoid of reason and moral sense as the code itself do you give the name of a method to an alphabetical chronological analogical or merely nominal classification of subjects do you give the name of method to these lists of paragraphs gathered under an arbitrary head these sophistical vagaries this mass of contradictory quotations and opinions this nauseous style this spasmodic rhetoric models of which are so common at the bar though seldom found elsewhere do you take for philosophy this twaddle this intolerable pettifoggery adorned with a few scholastic trimmings no no a writer who respects himself will never consent to enter the balance with these manipulators of law misnamed jurists and for my part i object to a comparison two reason of intention as far as i am permitted to divulge this secret i am a conspirator in an immense revolution terrible to charlatans and despots to all exploiters of the poor and credulous to all salaried idlers dealers in political panaceas and parables tyrants in a word of thought and of opinion i labor to stir up the reason of individuals to insurrection against the reason of authorities according to the laws of the society of which i am a member all the evils which afflict humanity arise from faith in external teachings and submission to authority and not to go outside of our own century is it not true for instance that france is plundered scoffed at and tyrannized over because she speaks in masses and not by heads the french people are penned up in three or four flocks receiving their signal from a chief responding to the voice of a leader and thinking just as he says a certain journal it is said has fifty thousand subscribers assuming six readers to every subscriber we have three hundred thousand sheep browsing and bleeding at the same cratch apply this calculation to whole periodical press and you find that in our free and intelligent france there are two millions of creatures receiving every morning from the journals spiritual pasturage two millions in other words the entire nation allows a score of little fellows to lead it by the nose by no means sir do i deny to journalists talent science love of truth patriotism and what you please they are very worthy and intelligent people whom i undoubtedly should wish to resemble had i the honor to know them that of which i complain and that which has made me a conspirator is that instead of enlightening us these gentlemen command us impose upon us articles of faith and that without demonstration or verification when for example i asked why these fortifications of paris which in former times under the influence of certain prejudices and by means of a concurrence of extraordinary circumstances supposed for the sake of the argument to have existed may perhaps have served to protect us but which it is doubtful whether our descendants will ever use when i ask i say on what grounds they assimilate the future to a hypothetical past they reply that monsieur thiers who has a great mind has written upon this subject a report of admirable elegance and marvelous clearness at this i become angry and reply that monsieur thiers does not know what he is talking about why having wanted no detached forts seven years ago do we want them today oh damn it they say the difference is great the first forts were too near to us with these we cannot be bombarded 
you cannot be bombarded but you can be blockaded and will be if you stir what to obtain blockade forts from the parisians it has sufficed to prejudice them against bombardment forts and they thought to outwit the government oh the sovereignty of the people damn it monsieur thiers who is wiser than you says that it would be absurd to suppose a government making war upon citizens and maintaining itself by force and in spite of the will of the people that would be absurd perhaps so such a thing has happened more than once and may happen again besides when despotism is strong it appears almost legitimate however that may be they lied in eighteen thirty three and they lie again in eighteen forty one those who threaten us with the bombshell and then if monsieur thiers is so well assured of the intentions of the government why does he not wish the forts to be built before the circuit is extended why this air of suspicion of the government unless an intrigue has been planned between the government and monsieur thiers damn it we do not wish to be again invaded if paris had been fortified in eighteen fifteen napoleon would not have been conquered but i tell you that napoleon was not conquered but sold and that if in eighteen fifteen paris had fortifications it would have been with them as with the thirty thousand men of Grochet who were misled during the battle it is still easier to surrender forts than to lead soldiers would the selfish and the cowardly ever lack reasons for yielding to the enemy but do you not see that the absolutist courts are provoked at our fortifications a proof that they do not think as you do you believe that and for my part i believe that in reality they are quite at ease about the matter and if they appear to tease our ministers they do so only to give the latter an opportunity to decline the absolutist courts are always on better terms with our constitutional monarchy than our monarchy with us does not monsieur guizois say that france needs to be defended within as well as without within against whom against france o oh, parisians it is but six months since you demanded war and now you want only barricades why should the allies fear your doctrines when you cannot even control yourselves how could you sustain a siege when you weep over the absence of an actress but finally do you not understand that by the rules of modern warfare the capital of a country is always the objective point of its assailants suppose our army defeated on the rhine france invaded and defenceless paris falling into the hands of the enemy it would be the death of the administrative power without a head it could not live the capital taken the nation must submit what do you say to that the reply is very simple why is society constituted in such a way that the destiny of the country depends upon the safety of the capital why in case our territory be invaded and paris besieged cannot the legislative executive and military powers act outside of paris why this localization of all the vital forces of france do not cry out upon decentralization this hackneyed reproach would discredit only your own intelligence and sincerity it is not a question of decentralization it is your political fetishism which i attack why should the national unity be attached to a certain place to certain functionaries to certain bayonets why should the place maubert and the palace of the two years be the palladium of france end of section twenty eight second memoir part six Section 29 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Second Memoir, Part 7. Now let me make an hypothesis suppose it were written in the charter in case the country be again invaded and paris forced to surrender the government being annihilated and the national assembly dissolved the electoral colleges shall reassemble spontaneously and without other official notice for the purpose of appointing new deputies who shall organize a provisional government at orleans if orleans succumbs the government shall reconstruct itself in the same way at lyons then at bordeaux then at bayonne until all france be captured or the enemy driven from the land for the government may perish but the nation never dies the king the peers and the deputies massacred vive la france 
do you not think that such an addition to the charter would be better safeguard for the liberty and integrity of the country than walls and bastions around paris well then do henceforth for administration industry science literature and art that which the charter ought to prescribe for the central government and common defense instead of endeavoring to render paris impregnable try rather to render the loss of paris an insignificant matter instead of accumulating about one point academies faculties schools and political administrative and judicial centers instead of arresting intellectual development and weakening public spirit in the provinces by this fatal agglomeration can you not without destroying unity distribute social functions among places as well as among persons such a system in allowing each province to participate in political power and action and in balancing industry intelligence and strength in all parts of the country would equally secure against enemies at home and enemies abroad the liberty of the people and the stability of the government discriminate then between the centralization of functions and the concentration of organs between political unity and its material symbol oh that is plausible but it is impossible which means that the city of paris does not intend to surrender its privileges and that there is still a question of property idle talk the country in a state of panic which has been cleverly worked upon has asked for fortifications i dare to affirm that it has advocated its sovereignty all parties are to blame for this suicide the conservatives by their acquiescence in the plans of the government the friends of the dynasty because they wish no opposition to that which pleases them and because a popular revolution would annihilate them the democrats because they hope to rule in their turn footnote armand carrel would have favored the fortification of the capital la nationale has said again and again placing the name of its old editor by the side of the names of napoleon and valban what signifies this exhumation of an anti-popular politician it signifies that armand carrel wished to make government an individual and irremovable but elective property and that he wished this property to be elected not by the people but by the army the political system of carrel was simply a reorganization of the praetorian guards carrel also hated the pekins that which he deplored in the revolution of july was not they say the insurrection of the people but the victory of the people over the soldiers that is the reason why carrel after eighteen thirty would never support the patriots do you answer me with a few regiments he asked armand carrel regarded the army the military power as the basis of law and government this man undoubtedly had a moral sense within him but he surely had no sense of justice were he still in this world i declare it boldly liberty would have no greater enemy than carrel and a footnote that which all rejoice at having obtained is a means of future repression as for the defense of the country they are not troubled about that the idea of tyranny dwells in the minds of all and brings together into one conspiracy all forms of selfishness we wish the regeneration of society but we subordinate this desire to our ideas and convenience that our approaching marriage may take place that our business may succeed that our opinions may triumph we postpone reform intolerance and selfishness lead us to put fetters upon liberty and because we cannot wish all that god wishes we would if it rested with us stay the course of destiny rather than sacrifice our own interests and self-love is this not an instance where the words of solomon apply la iniquiti emanti aememe it is said that on this question of the fortification of paris the staff of la nationale are not agreed this would prove if proof were needed that a journal may blunder and falsify without entitling any one to accuse its editors a journal is a metaphysical being for which no one is really responsible and which owes its existence solely to mutual concessions this idea ought to frighten those worthy citizens who because they borrow their opinions from a journal imagine that they belong to a political party and who have not the faintest suspicion that they are really without a head for this reason sir i have enlisted in a desperate war against every form of authority over the multitude advanced sentinel of the proletariat i cross bayonets with the celebrities of the day as well as with spies and charlatans well when i am fighting with an illustrious adversary must i stop at the end of every phrase like an orator in the tribune to say the learned author the eloquent writer 
the profound publicist, and a hundred other platitudes with which it is fashionable to mock people? These civilities seem to me no less insulting to the man attacked than dishonorable to the aggressor. But, when rebuking an author, I say to him, Citizen, your doctrine is absurd, and, if to prove my assertion is offense against you, I am guilty of it. Immediately the listener opens his ears. He is all attention, and if I do not succeed in convincing him, at least I gave his thought an impulse and set him the wholesome example of doubt and free examination. Then do not think, sir, that in tripping up the philosophy of your very learned and very estimable confrere, Monsieur Troplong, I fail to appreciate his talent as a writer. In my opinion, he has too much for a jurist, nor his knowledge, though it is too closely confined to the letter of the law and the reading of old books. In these particulars, Monsieur Troplong offends on the side of excess rather than deficiency. Further, do not believe that I am actuated by any personal animosity towards him, or that I have the slightest desire to wound his self-love. I know Monsieur Trapelong only by his treatise on prescription, which I wish he had not written, and as for my critics, neither Monsieur Trapelong nor any of those whose opinion I value will ever read me. Once more, my only object is to prove, as far as I am able, to this unhappy French nation, that those who make the laws, as well as those who interpret them, are not infallible organs of general, impersonal, and absolute reason. I had resolved to submit to a systematic criticism the semi-official defense of the right of property recently put forth by Monsieur Wolowski, your colleague at the conservatory. With this view, I had commenced to collect the documents necessary for each of his lectures, but, soon perceiving that the ideas of the professor were incoherent, that his arguments contradicted each other, that one affirmation was sure to be overthrown by another, and that in Monsieur Wolowski's lucubrations the good was always mingled with the bad, and being by nature a little suspicious, it suddenly occurred to me that Monsieur Wolowski was an advocate of equality in disguise, thrown in spite of himself into the position in which the patriarch Jacob pictures one of his sons, inter duas clitellus, between two stools, as the proverb says. In more parliamentary language, I saw clearly that Monsieur Wolowski was placed between his profound convictions on the one hand and his official duties on the other, and that, in order to maintain his position, he had to assume a certain slant. Then I experienced great pain at seeing the reserve, the circumlocution, the figures, and the irony to which a professor of legislation, whose duty it is to teach dogmas with clearness and precision, was forced to resort and I fell to cursing the society in which an honest man is not allowed to say frankly what he thinks. Never, sir, have you conceived of such torture. I seemed to be witnessing the martyrdom of a mind. I am going to give you an idea of these astonishing meetings, or rather of these scenes of sorrow. Monday, November twentieth, 1940. The professor declares in brief, one, that the right of property is not founded upon occupation, but upon the impress of man. 2. That every man has a natural and inalienable right to the use of matter. Now, if matter can be appropriated, and if, notwithstanding, all men retain an inalienable right to the use of this matter, what is property? And if matter can be appropriated only by labor, how long is this appropriation to continue? Questions that will confuse and confound all jurists whatsoever. Then Monsieur Wolowski cites his authorities. Great God! What witnesses he brings forward! First, Monsieur Trapelong, the great metaphysician, whom we have discussed. Then, Monsieur Louis Blanc, editor of the Revue du Progrès, who came near being tried by jury for publishing his Organization of Labor, and who escaped from the clutches of the public prosecutor only by a juggler's trick. Footnote. In a very short article which was read by Monsieur Wolowski, Monsieur Louis Blanc declares in substance that he is not a communist, which I easily believe, that one must be a fool to attack property, but he does not say why, and that it is very necessary to guard against confounding property with its abuses. When Voltaire overthrew Christianity, he repeatedly avowed that he had no spite against religion, but only against its abuses. End of footnote. Corinne, I mean Madame de Stal, who, in an ode, making a poetical comparison of the land with waves, of the furrow of a plow with the wake of a vessel, says, that property exists only where man has left his trace, which makes property dependent upon the solidity of the elements, 
Rousseau, the apostle of liberty and equality, but who, according to Monsieur Wolowski, attacked property only as a joke, in order to point to a paradox, Robespierre, who prohibited a division of the land because he regarded such a measure as a rejuvenescence of the property, and who, while awaiting the definitive organization of the republic, placed all property in the care of people, that is, transferred the right of eminent domain from the individual to society, Beaubuff, who wanted property for the nation and communism for the citizens, Monsieur Considerant, who favors a division of landed property into shares, that is, who wishes to render property nominal and fictitious, the whole being intermingled with jokes and witticism, intended undoubtedly to lead people away from the hornet's nests, at the expense of the adversaries of the right of property. November 26th, Monsieur Wolowski supposes this objection. Land, like water, air, and light, is necessary to life, therefore it cannot be appropriated. And he replies, the importance of landed property diminishes as the power of industry increases. Good. This importance diminishes, but does not disappear, and this of itself shows landed property to be illegitimate. Here, Monsieur Wolowski pretends to think that the opponents of property refer only to property in land, while they merely take it as a term of comparison, and, in showing with wonderful clearness the absurdity of the position in which he places them, he finds a way of drawing the attention of his hearers to another subject without being false to the truth which it is his office to contradict. Property, says Monsieur Wolowski, is that which distinguishes man from the animals. That may be, but are we to regard this as a compliment or a satire? Mohammed, says Monsieur Wolowski, decreed property. And so did Genghis Khan and Tamerlane, all ravagers of nations. What sort of legislators were they? Property has been in existence ever since the origin of the human race. Yes, and so has slavery and despotism also, and likewise polygamy and idolatry. But what does this antiquity show? The members of the Council of the State... Monsieur Portalis at their head, did not raise, in their discussion of the code, the question of the legitimacy of property. Their silence, says Monsieur Wolowski, is a precedent in favor of this right. I may regard this reply as personally addressed to me, since the observation belongs to me. I reply, as long as an opinion is universally admitted, the universality of belief serves of itself as argument and proof. When this same opinion is attacked, the former faith proves nothing. We must resort to reason. Ignorance, however old and pardonable it may be, never outweighs reason. Property has its abuses, Monsieur Wolowski confesses. But, he said, these abuses gradually disappear. Today their cause is known. They all arise from a false theory of property. In principle, property is inviolable, but it can and must be checked and disciplined. Such are the conclusions of the professor. When one thus remains in the clouds, he need not fear to equivocate. Nevertheless, I would like him to divine these abuses of property, to show their cause, to explain this true theory from which no abuse is to spring, in short, to tell me how, without destroying property, it can be governed for the greatest good of all. Our civil code, says Monsieur Wolowski, in speaking of this subject, leaves much to be desired. I think it leaves everything undone. Finally, Monsieur Wolowski opposes on the one hand the concentration of capital and the absorption which results therefrom, and on the other he objects to the extreme division of the land. Now I think that I have demonstrated in my first memoir that large accumulation and minute division are the first two terms of an economical trinity, a thesis and an antithesis. But while Monsieur Wolowski says nothing of the third term, the synthesis, and thus leaves the inference in suspense, I have shown that this third term is association, which is the annihilation of property. November 30th, Literary Property Monsieur Wolowski grants that it is just to recognize the rights of talent, which is not in the least hostile to equality, but he seriously objects to perpetual and absolute property in the works of genius to the profit of the author's heirs. His main argument is that society has a right of collective production over every creation of the mind. Now, it is precisely this principle of collective power that I developed in my inquiries into property and government, and on which I have established the complete edifice of a new social organization. Monsieur Wolowski is, as far as I know, the first jurist who has made a legislative application of this economical law. 
only while i have extended the principle of collective power to every sort of product monsieur wolowski more prudent than it is my nature to be confined it to neutral ground so that that which i am bold enough to say of the whole he is contented to affirm of a part leaving the intelligent hearer to fill up the void for himself however his arguments are keen and close one feels that the professor finding himself more at ease with one aspect of property has given the rein to his intellect and is rushing on towards liberty one absolute literary property would hinder the activity of other men and obstruct the development of humanity it would be the death of progress it would be suicide what would have happened if the first inventions the plough the level the saw etc had been appropriated such is the first proposition of monsieur wolowski i reply absolute property in land and tools hinders human activity and obstructs progress in the free development of man what happened in rome and in all the ancient nations what occurred in the middle ages what do we see today in england in consequence of absolute property and the sources of production the suicide of humanity two real and personal property is in harmony with the social interest in consequence of literary property social and individual interests are perpetually in conflict the statement of this proposition contains a rhetorical figure common with those who do not enjoy full and complete liberty of speech this figure is the antiphrasis or the contre verite it consists according to dumarsay and the best humanists in saying one thing while meaning another monsieur wolowski's proposition naturally expressed would read as follows just as real and personal property is essentially hostile to society so in consequence of literary property social and individual interests are perpetually in conflict three monsieur de montalembert in the chamber of peers vehemently protested against the assimilation of authors to inventors of machinery an assimilation which he claimed to be injurious to the former monsieur wolowski replies that the rights of authors without machinery would be nil that without paper mills type foundries and printing offices there could be no sale of verse or prose that it many a mechanical invention the compass for instance the telescope or the steam engine is quite as valuable as a book prior to monsieur montalembert monsieur charles comte had laughed at the inference in favor of mechanical inventions which logical minds never fail to draw from the privileges granted to authors he says monsieur comte who first conceived and executed the idea of transforming a piece of wood into a pair of sabots or an animal's hide into a pair of sandals would thereby have acquired an exclusive right to make shoes for the human race undoubtedly under the system of property for in fact this pair of sabots over which you make so merry is the creation of the shoemaker the work of his genius the expression of his thought to him it is his poem quite as much as le roi samus is monsieur victor hugo's drama justice for all alike if you refuse a patent to a perfecter of boots refuse also a privilege to a maker of rhymes four that which gives importance to a book is a fact external to the author and his work without the intelligence of society without its development and a certain community of ideas passions and interests between it and the authors the works of the latter would be worth nothing the exchangeable value of a book is due even more to the social condition than to the talent displayed in it indeed it seems as if i were copying my own words the proposition of monsieur wolowski contains a special expression of a general and absolute idea one of the strongest and most conclusive against the right of property why do artists like mechanics find the means to live because society has made the fine arts like the rudest industries objects of consumption and exchange governed consequently by all the laws of commerce and political economy now the first of these laws is the equipoise of functions that is the equality of associates five monsieur wolowski indulges in sarcasm against the petitioners for literary property there are authors he says who crave the privileges of authors and who for that purpose point out the power of the melodrama they speak of the niece of corneille begging at the door of a theatre which the works of her uncle had enriched to satisfy the avarice of literary people it would be necessary to create literary majorats and make a whole code of exceptions i like this virtuous irony 
but monsieur wolowski has by no means exhausted the difficulties which the question involves and first is it just that monsieur's cousin guizot via main de miron and company paid by the state for delivering lectures should be paid a second time through the booksellers that i who have the right to report their lectures should not have the right to print them is it just that Messieurs Noel and Chafsol, overseers of the university, should use their influence in selling their selections from literature to the youth whose studies they are instructed to superintend in consideration of a salary? And, if that is not just, is it not proper to refuse literary property to every author holding public offices and receiving pensions and sinecures? Again, shall the privilege of the author extend to irreligious and immoral works calculated only to corrupt the heart and obscure the understanding to grant this privilege is to sanction immorality by law to refuse it is to censure the author and since it is impossible in the present imperfect state of society to prevent all violations of the moral law it will be necessary to open a license office for books as well as morals but then three-fourths of our literary people will be obliged to register and recognize thenceforth on their own declaration as prostitutes they will necessarily belong to the public we pay toll to the prostitute we do not endow her finally shall plagiarism be classed with forgery if you reply yes you appropriate in advance all of the subjects of which books treat if you say no you leave the whole matter to the decision of the judge except in the case of a clandestine reprint how will he distinguish forgery from quotation imitation plagiarism or even coincidence a savant spends two years in calculating a table of logarithms to nine or ten decimals he prints it a fortnight after his book is selling at half price it is impossible to tell whether this result is due to forgery or competition what shall the court do in case of doubt shall it award the property to the first occupant as well decide the question by lot these however are trifling considerations but do we see that in granting a perpetual privilege to authors and their heirs we really strike a fatal blow at their interests we think to make booksellers dependent upon authors a delusion the booksellers will unite against works and their proprietors against works by refusing to push their sale by replacing them with poor imitations by reproducing them in a hundred indirect ways and no one knows how far the science of plagiarism and skillful imitation may be carried against proprietors are we ignorant of the fact that a demand for a dozen copies enables a bookseller to sell a thousand that with an addition of five hundred he can supply a kingdom for thirty years what will the poor authors do in the presence of this omnipotent union of booksellers i will tell them what they will do they will enter the employ of those whom they now treat as pirates and to secure an advantage they will become wage laborers a fit reward for ignoble avarice and insatiable pride footnote the property fever is at its height among writers and artists and it is curious to see the complacency with which our legislators and men of letters cherish this devouring passion an artist sells a picture and then the merchandise delivered assumes to prevent the purchaser from selling engravings under the pretext that he the painter in selling the original has not sold his design a dispute arises between the amateur and the artist in regard to both the fact and the law monsieur villemain the minister of public instruction being consulted as to this particular case finds that the painter is right only the property in the design should have been specially reserved in the contract so that in reality monsieur villemain recognizes in the artist a power to surrender his work and to prevent its communication thus contradicting the legal axiom one cannot give and keep at the same time a strange reasoner is monsieur villemain an ambiguous principle leads to a false conclusion instead of rejecting the principle monsieur philomain hastens to admit the conclusion with him the reductio ad absurdum is a convincing argument thus he is made official defender of literary property sure of being understood and sustained by a set of loafers the disgrace of literature and the plague of public morals why then does monsieur villemain feel so strong an interest in settling himself up as the chief of the literary classes in playing for their benefit the role of triceton in the councils of the state and in becoming the accomplice and associate of a band of profligates soi disant men of letters who for more than ten years have labored with such deplorable success to ruin public spirit and corrupt the heart by warping the mind and a footnote contradictions of contradictions genius is the great leveller of the world 
cries monsieur de lamartine then genius should be a proprietor literary property is the fortune of democracy this unfortunate poet thinks himself profound when he is only puffed up his eloquence consists solely in coupling ideas which clash with each other round square dark sun fallen angel priest and love thought and poetry genius and fortune leveling and property let us tell him in reply that his mind is a dark luminary that each of his discourses is a disordered harmony and that all his successes whether in verse or prose are due to the use of the extraordinary in the treatment of the most ordinary subjects le national in reply to the report of monsieur lamartine endeavors to prove that literary property is of a quite different nature from landed property as if the nature of the right of property depended on the object to which it was applied and not on the mode of its exercise and the condition of its existence but the main object of le national is to please a class of proprietors whom an extension of the right of property vexes that is why le national opposes literary property will it tell us once for all whether it is for equality or against it six objection property in occupied land passes to the heirs of the occupant why say the authors should not the work of genius pass in a like manner to the heirs of the man of genius monsieur wolowski's reply because the labor of the first occupant is continued by his heirs while the heirs of an author neither change nor add to his works in landed property the continuance of labor explains the continuance of right yes when the labor is continued but if the labor is not continued the right ceases thus is the right of possession founded on personal labor recognized by monsieur wolowski monsieur wolowski decides in favor of granting to authors property in their works for a certain number of years dating from the day of their first publication the succeeding lectures on patents and inventions were no less instructive although intermingled with shocking contradictions inserted with a view to make the useful truths more palatable the necessity for brevity compels me to terminate this examination here not without regret thus of two eclectic jurists who attempt a defense of property one is entangled in a set of dogmas without principle or method and is constantly talking nonsense and the other designedly abandons the cause of property in order to present under the same name the theory of individual possession was i wrong in claiming that confusion reigned among legists and ought i to be legally prosecuted for having said that their science henceforth stood convicted of falsehood its glory eclipsed the ordinary resources of law no longer sufficing philosophy political economy and the framers of systems have been consulted all the oracles appealed to have been discouraging end of section twenty nine second memoir part seven Section 30 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Meilinger. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Second Memoir, Part 8 the philosophers are no clearer today than at the time of the eclectic efflorescence nevertheless through their mystical epithems we can distinguish the words progress unity association solidarity fraternity which are certainly not reassuring to proprietors one of these philosophers m pierre leroux has written two large books in which he claims to show by all religious, legislative, and philosophical systems that, since men are responsible to each other, equality of conditions is the final law of society. It is true that this philosopher admits a kind of property, but as he leaves us to imagine what property would become in presence of equality, we may boldly class him with the opponents of the right of increase. I must here declare freely in order that i may not be suspected of secret connivance which is foreign to my nature that m leroux has my full sympathy not that i am a believer in his quasi pythagorean philosophy upon this subject i should have more than one observation to submit to him provided a veteran covered with stripes would not despise the remarks of a conscript not that i feel bound to this author by any special consideration for his opposition to property 
in my opinion monsieur leroux could and even ought to state his position more explicitly and logically but i like i admire in monsieur leroux the antagonist of our philosophical demigods the demolisher of usurped reputations the pitiless critic of everything that is respected because of its antiquity such is the reason for my high esteem for monsieur leroux such would be the principle of the only literary association which in this century of coteries i should care to form we need men who like monsieur leroux call in question social principles not to diffuse doubt concerning them but to make them doubly sure men who excite the mind by bold negations and make the conscience tremble by doctrines of annihilation where is the man who does not shudder on hearing monsieur leroux exclaim there is neither a paradise nor a hell the wicked will not be punished nor the good rewarded mortals cease to hope and fear you revolve in a circle of appearances humanity is an immortal tree whose branches withering one after another feed with their debris the root which is always young where is the man who on hearing this desolate confession of faith does not demand with terror is it then true that i am only an aggregate of elements organized by an unknown force an idea realized for a few moments a form which passes and disappears is it true that my mind is only a harmony and my soul a vortex what is the ego what is god what is the sanction of society in former times m leroux would have been regarded as a great culprit worthy only like vanini of death and universal execration Today, M. Leroux is fulfilling a mission of salvation, for which, whatever he may say, he will be rewarded. Like those gloomy invalids who are always talking of their approaching death, and who faint when the doctor's opinion confirms their pretense, our materialistic society is agitated and loses countenance while listening to this startling decree of the philosopher, Thou shalt die. Honor, then, to M. Leroux who has revealed to us the cowardice of the epicureans to m leroux who renders new philosophical solutions necessary honour to the anti-eclectic to the apostle of equality in his work on humanity m leroux commences by positing the necessity of property you wish to abolish property but do you not see that thereby you would annihilate man and even the name of man you wish to abolish property but could you live without a body? I will not tell you that it is necessary to support this body. I will tell you that this body is itself a species of property. In order clearly to understand the doctrine of M. Leroux, it must be borne in mind that there are three necessary and primitive forms of society. Communism, property, and that which today we properly call association. M. Leroux rejects in the first place communism and combats it with all his might man is a personal and free being and therefore needs a sphere of independence and individual activity m leroux emphasizes this in adding you wish neither family nor country nor property therefore no more fathers no more sons no more brothers here you are related to no being in time and therefore without a name here you are alone in the midst of a billion of men who today inhabit the earth how do you expect me to distinguish you in space in the midst of all this multitude if man is indistinguishable he is nothing now he can be distinguished individualized only through a devotion of certain things to his use such as his body his faculties and the tools which he uses hence says m leroux the necessity of appropriation in short property but property on what condition here m leroux after having condemned communism denounces in its turn the right of domain his whole doctrine can be summed up in this single proposition man may be made by property a slave or a despot by turns that posited if we ask m leroux to tell us under what system of property man will be neither a slave nor a despot but free just and a citizen M. Leroux replies in the third volume of his work on humanity. There are three ways of destroying man's communion with his fellows and with the universe. 1. By separating man in time. 2. 
by separating him in space, three, by dividing the land, or, in general terms, the instruments of production, by attaching man to things, by subordinating man to property, by making man a proprietor. This language, it must be confessed, savors a little too strongly of the metaphysical heights which the author frequents, and of the school of Monsieur Cousin. Nevertheless, it can be seen, clearly enough it seems to me, that M. Leroux opposes the exclusive appropriation of the instruments of production. Only he calls this non-appropriation of the instruments of production a new method of establishing property, while I, in accordance with all precedent, call it a destruction of property. In fact, without the appropriation of instruments, property is nothing. Quote, Hitherto, we have confined ourselves to pointing out and combating the despotic features of property, by considering property alone. We have failed to see that the despotism of property is a correlative of the division of the human race, that property, instead of being organized in such a way as to facilitate the unlimited communion of man with his fellows and with the universe, has been, on the contrary, turned against this communion. End quote. Let us translate this into commercial phraseology. In order to destroy despotism and the inequality of conditions, men must cease from competition and must associate their interests. Let employer and employed, now enemies and rivals, become associates. Now, ask any manufacturer, merchant or capitalist whether he would consider himself a proprietor if he were to share his revenue and profits with this mass of wage laborers whom it is proposed to make his associates. Quote, Family, property and country are finite things, which ought to be organized with a view to the infinite. For man is a finite being, who aspires to the infinite. To him, absolute finiteness is evil. The infinite is his aim, the indefinite his right. End quote. Few of my readers would understand these hierophantic words, were I to leave them unexplained. M. Leroux means, by this magnificent formula, that humanity is a single immense society, which, in its collective unity, represents the infinite. That every nation, every tribe, every commune, and every citizen are, in different degrees, fragments or finite members of the infinite society, the evil in which results solely from individualism and privilege. In other words, from the subordination of the infinite to the finite. Finally, that, to attain humanity's end and aim, each part has a right to an indefinitely progressive development. Quote, All the evils which afflict the human race arise from caste. The family is a blessing. The family caste, the nobility, is an evil. Country is a blessing. The country caste, supreme, domineering, conquering, is an evil. Property, individual possession, is a blessing. The property caste, the domain of property of Portier, Toulier, Troplong, etc., is an evil. End quote. Thus, according to M. Leroux, there is property and property, the one good, the other bad. Now, as it is proper to call different things by different names, if we keep the name property for the former, we must call the latter robbery, rapine, brigandage. If, on the contrary, we reserve the name property for the latter, we must designate the former by the term possession, or some other equivalent. Otherwise, we should be troubled with an unpleasant synonymy. What a blessing it would be if philosophers, daring for once to say all that they think, would speak the language of ordinary mortals. Nations and rulers would derive much greater profit from their lectures, and, applying the same names to the same ideas, would come perhaps to understand each other. I boldly declare that in regard to property, I hold no other opinion than that of M. Leroux. But, if I should adopt the style of the philosopher and repeat after him, property is a blessing, but the property cast, the status quo of property, is an evil, I should be extolled as a genius by all the bachelors who write for the reviews. Footnote. Monsieur Leroux has been highly praised in a review for having defended property. I do not know whether the industrious encyclopedist is pleased with the praise, 
but I know very well that in his place I should mourn for reason and for truth. End of footnote. If, on the contrary, I prefer the classic language of Rome and the civil code, and say accordingly, possession is a blessing, but property is robbery, immediately the aforesaid bachelors rise a hue and cry against the monster, and the judge threatens me. Oh, the power of language! Le National, on the other hand, has laughed at Monsieur Leroux and his ideas on property, charging him with tautology and childishness. Le National does not wish to understand. Is it necessary to remind this journal that it has no right to deride a dogmatic philosopher, because it is without a doctrine itself? From its foundation, Le National has been a nursery of intriguers and renegades. From time to time it takes care to warn its readers. Instead of lamenting over all its defections, the democratic sheet would do better to lay the blame on itself, and confess the shallowness of its theories. When will this organ of popular interests and the electoral reform cease to hire sceptics and spread doubt? I will wager, without going further, that M. Léon du Rocher, the critic of M. Leroux, is an anonymous or pseudonymous editor of some bourgeois or even aristocratic journal. The economists, questioned in their turn, propose to associate capital and labor. You know, sir, what that means. If we follow out the doctrine, we soon find that it ends in an absorption of property, not by the community, but by a general and indissoluble commandite, so that the condition of the proprietor would differ from that of the workingman only in receiving larger wages. This system, with some peculiar additions and embellishments, is the idea of the phalanstery. But it is clear that, if inequality of conditions is one of the attributes of property, it is not the whole of property. That which makes property a delightful thing, as some philosopher, I know not who, has said, is the power to dispose at will, not only of one's own goods, but of their specific nature, to use them at pleasure, to confine and enclose them, to excommunicate mankind, as Monsieur Pierre Leroux says, in short, to make such use of them as passion, interest, or even caprice may suggest. What is the possession of money, a share in an agricultural or industrial enterprise, or a government bond coupon, in comparison with the infinite charm of being master of one's house and grounds, under one's vine and fig tree? Beati possidentes, says an author quoted by Monsieur Troplon. Seriously, can this be applied to a man of income? who has no other possession under the sun than the market, and in his pocket his money. As well maintain that a trough is a coward. A nice method of reform. They never cease to condemn the thirst for gold, and the growing individualism of the century. And yet, most inconceivable of contradictions, they prepare to turn all kinds of property into one. Property in coin. I must say something further of a theory of property lately put forth with some ado. I mean the theory of Monsieur Considerant. The Fourierists are not men who examine a doctrine in order to ascertain whether it conflicts with their system. On the contrary, it is their custom to exult and sing songs of triumph whenever an adversary passes without perceiving or noticing them. These gentlemen want direct refutations, in order that, if they are beaten, they may have at least the selfish consolation of having been spoken of. Well, let their wish be gratified. M. Considerant makes the most lofty pretensions to logic. His method of procedure is always that of major, minor, and conclusion. He would willingly write upon his head, Argumentator in Barbara. But M. Considerant is too intelligent and quick-witted to be a good logician, as is proved by the fact that he appears to have taken the syllogism for logic. The syllogism, as everybody knows who is interested in philosophical curiosities, is the first and perpetual sophism of the human mind, the favorite tool of falsehood, the stumbling block of science, the advocate of crime. The syllogism has produced all the evils which the fabulist so eloquently condemned, and has done nothing good or useful. It is as devoid of truth as of justice. We might apply to it these words of scripture, Celui qui met en lieu sa confiance périra. Consequently, the best philosophers long since condemned it, so that now none but the enemies of reason wish to make the syllogism its weapon. 
Monsieur Considerant, then, has built his theory of property upon a syllogism. Would he be disposed to stake the system of Fourier upon his arguments, as I am ready to risk the whole doctrine of equality upon my refutation of that system? Such a duel would be quite in keeping with the warlike and chivalric taste of Monsieur Considerant, and the public would profit by it. For one of the two adversaries failing, no more would be said about him, and there would be one grumbler less in the world. The theory of Monsieur Considerant has this remarkable feature, that in attempting to satisfy at the same time the claims of both laborers and proprietors, it infringes alike upon the rights of the former and the privileges of the latter. In the first place, the author lays it down as a principle, one, that the use of the land belongs to each member of the race, that it is a natural and imprescriptible right, similar in all respects to the right to the air and the sunshine. 2. That the right to labor is equally fundamental, natural, and imprescriptible. I have shown that the recognition of this double right would be the death of property. I denounce Monsieur Considerant to the proprietors. But Monsieur Considerant maintains that the right to labor creates the right of property, and this is the way he reasons. Major premise. Every man legitimately possesses the thing which his labor, his skill, or in more general terms, his action, has created. To which M. Considerant adds, by way of comment, Indeed, the land not having been created by man, it follows from the fundamental principle of property that the land, being given to the race in common, can in no wise be the exclusive and legitimate property of such and such individuals, who were not the creators of this value. If I am not mistaken, there is no one to whom this proposition, at first sight and in its entirety, does not seem utterly unrefutable. Reader, distrust the syllogism. First, I observe that the words legitimately possesses signify to the author's mind legitimate proprietor. Otherwise the argument, being intended to prove the legitimacy of property, would have no meaning. I might here raise the question of the difference between property and possession, and call upon M. Considerant, before going further, to define the one and the other, but I pass on. This first proposition is doubly false. 1. In that it asserts the act of creation to be the only basis of property. 2. In that it regards this act as sufficient in all cases to authorize the right of property. And, in the first place, if man may be proprietor of the game which he does not create, but which he kills, of the fruits which he does not create, but which he gathers, of the vegetables which he does not create, but which he plants, of the animals which he does not create, but which he rears, it is conceivable that man may in like manner become proprietors of the land which they do not create, but which they clear and fertilize. The act of creation, then, is not necessary to the acquisition of the right of property. I say further, that this act alone is not always sufficient, and I prove it by the second premise of M. Considerant. Minor premise. Suppose that on an isolated island, on the soil of a nation, or over the whole face of the earth, the extent of the scene of action does not affect our judgment of the facts. A generation of human beings devotes itself for the first time to industry, agriculture, manufactures, etc., this generation, by its labor, intelligence, and activity, creates products, develops values, which did not exist on the cultivated land. Is it not perfectly clear that the property of this industrious generation will stand on a basis of right, if the value or wealth produced by the activity of all be distributed among the producers, according to each one's assistance in the creation of the general wealth? That is unquestionable. That is quite questionable, for this value or wealth, produced by the activity of all, is by the very fact of its creation collective wealth, the use of which, like that of the land, may be divided, but which as property remains undivided. And why this undivided ownership? Because the society which creates is itself indivisible, a permanent unit, incapable of reduction to fractions. And it is this unity of society which makes the land common property, and which, as M. Considerant says, renders its use imprescriptible in the case of every individual. Suppose, indeed, that at a given time the soil should be equally divided. 
the very next moment this division if it allowed the right of property would become illegitimate should there be the slightest irregularity in the method of transfer men members of society imprescriptible possessors of the land might be deprived at one blow of property possession and the means of production in short property in capital is indivisible and consequently unalienable not necessarily when the capital is uncreated but when it is common or collective i confirm this theory against monsieur considerant by the third term of his syllogism end of section thirty second memoir part eight Section 31 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Teddy. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Conclusion Part 1. The results of the labour performed by this generation are divisible into two classes, between which it is important clearly to distinguish. The first class includes the products of the soil which belong to this first generation, in its usufructory capacity augmented, improved and refined by its labour and industry. These products consist either of objects of consumption or instruments of labour. It is clear that these products are the legitimate property of those who have created them by their activity. Second class, not only has this generation created the products just mentioned, objects of consumption and instruments of labour, but it has also added to the original value of the soil by cultivation, by the erection of buildings, by all the labour producing permanent results which it has performed. This additional value evidently constitutes a product, a value created by the activity of the first generation, and if, by any means whatever, the ownership of this value be distributed among the members of society equitably, that is, in proportion to the labour which each has performed, each will legitimately possess the portion which he receives. He may then dispose of this legitimate and private property as he sees fit, exchange it, give it away, or transfer it, and to no other individual or collection of other individuals, that is, society, can lay any claim to these values. Thus, by the distribution of collective capital, to the use of which each associate, either in his own right or in right of his authors, has an imprescriptible and undivided title. There will be, in the phalanstery, as in the France of 1841, the poor and the rich, some men who, to live in luxury, have only, as Figaro says, to take the trouble to be born, and others for whom the fortune of life is but an opportunity for long-continued poverty, idlers with large incomes, and workers whose fortune is always in the future some privileged by birth and caste, and others pariahs whose sole civil and political rights are the right to labour and the right to land. For we must not be deceived. In the phalanstery everything will be as it is today, an object of property. Machines, inventions, thought, books, the products of art, of agriculture, and of industry, animals, houses, fences, vineyards, pastures, forests, fields, everything in short, except the uncultivated land. Now, would you like to know what uncultivated land is worth, according to the advocates of property? A square league hardly suffices for the support of a savage, says M. Charles Comte estimating the wretched subsistence of this savage at three hundred francs per year we find that the square league necessary to his life is relative to him faithfully represented by a rent of fifteen francs in france there are twenty-eight thousand square leagues the total rent of which by this estimate would be four hundred and twenty thousand francs 
which, when divided among nearly thirty-four millions of people, would give each an income of a centime and a quarter. That is the new right which the great genius of Fourier has invented in behalf of the French people, and with which his first disciple hopes to reform the world. I denounce M. Considerant to the proletariat. If the theory of M. Considerant would at least really guarantee this property, which he cherishes so jealously, I might pardon him the flaws in his syllogism, certainly the best one he ever made in his life. But no, that which M. Considerant takes for property is only a privilege of extra pay. In Fourier's system, neither the created capital nor the increased value of the soil are divided and appropriated in any effective manner. The instruments of labor, whether created or not, remain in the hands of the phalanx. The pretended proprietor can touch only the income. He is permitted neither to realize his share of the stock nor to possess it exclusively nor to administer it, whatever it be. The cashier throws him his dividend, and then, proprietor, eat the whole if you can. The system of Fourier would not suit the proprietors, since it takes away the most delightful feature of property, the free disposition of one's goods. It would please the communists no better, since it involves unequal conditions. It is repugnant to the friends of free association and equality in consequence of its tendency to wipe out human character and individuality by suppressing possession, family, and country, the threefold expression of the human personality. Of all our active publicists, none seem to me more fertile in resources, richer in imagination, more luxuriant and varied in style than M. Considerant. Nevertheless, I doubt if he will undertake to re-establish his theory of property. If he has this courage, this is what I would say to him. Before writing a reply, consider well your plan of action. Do not scour the country. Have recourse to none of your ordinary expedients. No complaints of civilization. No sarcasms upon equality. No glorification of the phalanstery. Leave Fourier and the departed in peace, and endeavour only to readjust the pieces of your syllogism. To this end, you ought first to analyse closely each proposition of your adversary, second, to show the error, either by a direct refutation or by proving the converse, third, to oppose argument to argument, so that objection and reply meeting face to face, the stronger may break down the weaker and shiver it to atoms. By that method only can you boast of having conquered, and compel me to regard you as an honest reasoner, and a good artilleryman. I should have no excuse for tarrying longer with these phalansterian crotchets, if the obligation which I have imposed upon myself of making a clean sweep, and the necessity of vindicating my dignity as a writer, did not prevent me from passing in silence the reproach uttered against me by a correspondent of La Falange. We have seen but lately, says this journalist, that M. Proudhon, enthusiast as he has been for the science created by Fourier, is, or will be, an enthusiast for anything else whatsoever. If ever sectarians had the right to reproach another for changes in his beliefs, this right certainly does not belong to the disciples of Fourier, who are always so eager to administer the phalansterian baptism to the deserters of all parties. But why regard it as a crime, if they are sincere? Of what consequence is the constancy or inconstancy of an individual to the truth, which is always the same? It is better to enlighten men's minds than to teach them to be obstinate in their prejudices. Do we not know that man is frail and fickle, that his heart is full of delusions, and that his lips are a distillery of falsehood, omnis homo modax? Whether we will or no, we all serve for a time as instruments of this truth, whose kingdom comes every day. God alone is immutable, because he is eternal.
That is the reply which I, as a general rule, an honest man is entitled always to make, and which I ought perhaps to be content to offer as an excuse, for I am no better than my father's. But in a century of doubt and apostasy like ours, when it is of importance to set the small and the weak an example of strength and honesty of utterance, I must not suffer my character as a public assailant of property to be dishonoured. I must render an account of my old opinions. Examining myself, therefore, upon this charge of Furism, and endeavouring to refresh my memory, I find that having been connected with the Furious in my studies and my friendships, it is possible that without knowing it I have been one of Fourier's partisans. Jerome Leland placed Napoleon and Jesus Christ in his catalogue of atheists. The Furious resemble this astronomer. If a man happens to find fault with the existing civilization, and to admit the truth of a few of their criticisms, they straightway enlist him, willy-nilly, in their school. Nevertheless, I do not deny that I have been a Furist, for since they say it, of course it must be so. But, sir, that of which my ex-associates are ignorant, and which doubtless will astonish you, is that I have been many other things. In religion, by turns, a Protestant, a Papist, an Arian, a Semi-Arian, a Manichaean, a Gnostic, an Adamite, even a Pre-Adamite, a Skeptic, a Pelagian, a Socian, an Anti-Trinitarian, and a Neo-Christian. In philosophy and politics, an Idealist, a pantheist, a platonist, a cartisan, an eclectic, a monarchist, an aristocrat, and a constitutionalist, a follower of Bebouf, and a communist. I have wandered through a whole encyclopedia of systems. Do you think it surprising, sir, that among them all I was, for a short time, a furist? Footnote. The Arians deny the divinity of Christ. The semi-Aryans differ from the Aryans only by a few subtle distinctions. M. Pierre Leroux, who regards Jesus as a man, but claims that the Spirit of God was infused into him, is a true semi-Aryan. The Manichaeans admit two coexistent eternal principles, God and matter, spirit and flesh, light and darkness, good and evil. But unlike the Phalansterians, who pretend to reconcile the two, the Manichaeans make war upon matter and labour, with all their might, for the destruction of the flesh, by condemning marriage and forbidding reproduction, which does not prevent them, however, from indulging in all the carnal pleasures which the intensest lust can conceive of. In this last particular, the tendency of the Furistic morality is quite Manichaean. The Gnostics do not differ from the early Christians, as their name indicates. They regarded themselves as inspired. Fourier, who held peculiar ideas concerning the visions of somnambulists, and who believed in the possibility of developing the magnetic power to such an extent as to enable us to commune with invisible beings, might, if he were living, pass also for a Gnostic. The Adamites attend Mass entirely naked, from motives of chastity. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who took the sleep of the senses for chastity, and who saw in modesty only a refinement of pleasure, inclined towards Adamism. I know such a sect whose members usually celebrate their mysteries in the costume of Venus coming from the bath. The Preadamites believe that men existed before the first man. I once met a Preadamite. True, he was deaf and a furist. The Pelagians deny grace and attribute all the merit of good works to liberty. The Furists, who teach that man's nature and passions are good, are reversed Pelagians. They give all to grace and nothing to liberty. The Sassinians, dias in all other aspects, admit an original revelation. Many people are Sassinians today who do not suspect it, and who regard their opinions as new. 
the neo-christians are those simpletons who admire christianity because it has produced bells and cathedrals base in soul corrupt in heart dissolute in mind and senses the neo-christians seek especially after the external form and admire religion as they love women for its physical beauty they believe in a coming revelation as well as a transfiguration of catholicism they will sing masses at the grand spectacle in the phalanstery End of footnote. for my part i am not at all surprised although at present I have no recollection of it. One thing is sure, that my superstition and credulity reached their height at the very period of my life which my critics reproachfully assign as the date of my heuristic beliefs. Now I hold quite other views. My mind no longer admits that which is demonstrated by syllogisms, analogies, or metaphors, which are the methods of the phalanstery, but demands a process of generalization and induction which excludes error. Of my past opinions, I retain absolutely none. I have acquired some knowledge. I no longer believe. I either know or I am ignorant. In a word, in seeking for the reason of things, I saw that I was a rationalist. Undoubtedly it would have been simpler to begin where I have ended. But then, if such is the law of the human mind, if all society for six thousand years has done nothing but fall into error, if all mankind are still buried in the darkness of faith deceived by their prejudices and passions guided only by the instincts of their leaders if my accusers themselves are not free from sectarianism for they call themselves furious i am alone inexcusable for having in my inner self at the secret tribunal of my conscience begun anew the journey of our poor humanity. I would by no means, then, deny my errors. But, sir, that which distinguishes me from those who rush into print is the fact that, though my thoughts have varied much, my writings do not vary. Today, even and on a multitude of questions, I am beset by a thousand extravagant and contradictory opinions, but my opinions I do not print, for the public has nothing to do with them. Before addressing my fellow men, I wait until light breaks in upon the chaos of my ideas, in order that what I may say may be, not the whole truth, no man can know that, but nothing but the truth. This singular disposition of my mind to first identify itself with a system in order to better understand it, and then to reflect upon it in order to test its legitimacy, is the very thing which disgusted me with Fourier, and ruined in my esteem the societary school. To be a faithful Fourierist, in fact one must abandon his reason and accept everything from a master, doctrine, interpretation, and application. M. Considerant, whose excessive intolerance anathematizes all who do not abide by his sovereign decisions, has no other conception of Fourierism. Has he not been appointed Fourier's vicar on earth and pope of a church which, unfortunately for its apostles, will never be of this world? Passive belief is the theological virtue of all sectarians, especially of the Fourierists. Now this is what happened to me while trying to demonstrate by argument the religion of which I had become a follower in studying Fourier. I suddenly perceived that by reasoning I was becoming incredulous, that on each article of the creed my reason and my faith were at variance, and that my six weeks' labour was wholly lost. I saw that the Fourierists, in spite of their inexhaustible gabble, and their extravagant pretension to decide in all things, were neither savants nor logicians, nor even believers, that they were scientific quacks, who were led more by their self-love than their conscience to labour for the triumph of their sect, and to whom all means were good that would reach that end. 
I then understood why to the Epicureans they promised women wine, music, and a sea of luxury, to the rigorous maintenance of marriage, purity of morals, and temperance, to laborers high wages, to proprietors large incomes, to philosophers solutions the secret of which Fourier alone possessed, to priests a costly religion, and magnificent festivals, to savants knowledge of an unimaginable nature, to each indeed that which he most desired. In the beginning this seemed to me droll, in the end I regarded it as the height of impudence. No, sir, no one yet knows of the foolishness and infamy which the Phalisterian system contains. That is a subject which I mean to treat as soon as I have balanced my accounts with property. Footnote. It should be understood that the above refers only to the moral and political doctrines of Fourier, doctrines which, like all philosophical and religious systems, have their root and raison d'etre existence in society itself, and for this reason deserve to be examined. The peculiar speculations of Fourier and his sect concerning cosmogony, geology, natural history, physiology, psychology, I leave to the attention of those who would think it their duty to seriously refute the fables of Bluebeard and the Ass's Skin. End of footnote. It is rumoured that the Furiists think of leaving France and going to the New World to found a phalanstery. When a house threatens to fall, the rats scamper away. That is because they are rats. Men do better, they rebuild it. Not long since, the St. Simeons, despairing of their country, which paid no heed to them, proudly shook the dust from their feet and started for the Orient to fight the battle of free women. Pride, wilfulness, mad selfishness, true charity, like true faith, does not worry, never despairs, it seeks neither its own glory nor its interest, nor empire. It does everything for all, speaks with indulgence to the reason and the will, and desires to conquer only by persuasion and sacrifice. Remain in France, Furius, if the progress of humanity is the only thing which you have at heart. There is more to do here than in the new world. Otherwise, go. You are nothing but liars and hypocrites. The foregoing statement by no means embraces all the political elements, all the opinions and tendencies which threaten the future of property, but it ought to satisfy anyone who knows how to classify facts and to deduce their law or the idea which governs them. Existing society seems abandoned to the demon of falsehood and discord, and it is this sad sight which grieves so deeply many distinguished minds who lived too long in a former age to be able to understand ours. Now, while the short-sighted spectator begins to despair of humanity, and distracted and cursing that of which he is ignorant, plunges into scepticism and fatalism, the true observer, certain of the spirit which governs the world, seeks to comprehend and fathom providence. The memoir on property published last year by the pensioner of the Academy of Besançon is simply a study of this nature. The time has come for me to relate the history of this unlucky treatise, which has already caused me so much chagrin, and made me so unpopular, but which was on my part so involuntary and unpremeditated, that I would dare to affirm that there is not an economist, not a philosopher, not a jurist, who is not a hundred times guiltier than I. There is something so singular in the way in which I was led to attack property, that if, on hearing my sad story, you persist, sir, in your blame, I hope at least you will be forced to pity me. I never have pretended to be a great politician. Far from that, I always have felt that for controversies of a political nature the greatest aversion, 
and if in my essay on property i have sometimes ridiculed our politicians believe sir that i was governed much less by my pride in the little that i know than by my vivid consciousness of their ignorance and excessive vanity relying more on providence than on man not suspecting at first that politics like every other science contained an absolute truth agreeing equally well with bessou and jean jacques i accepted with a resignation my share of human misery and contented myself with praying to god for good deputies upright ministers and an honest king by taste as well as by discretion and lack of confidence in my powers i was slowly pursuing some commonplace studies in theology mingled with a little metaphysics when i suddenly fell upon the greatest problem that ever has occupied philosophical minds i mean the criterion of certainty those of my readers who are unacquainted with the philosophical terminology will be glad to be told in a few words what this criterion is which plays so great a part in my work the criterion of certainty according to the philosophers will be when discovered an infallible method of establishing the truth of an opinion a judgment a theory or a system in nearly the same way as gold is recognized by the touchstone as iron approaches the magnet or better still as we verify a mathematical operation by applying the proof time has hitherto served as a sort of criterion for society thus the primitive men having observed that they were not all equal in strength beauty and labor judged and rightly that certain ones among them were called by nature to the performance of simple and common functions but they concluded and this is where their error lay that these same individuals of duller intellect more restricted genius and weaker personality were predestined to serve the others that is to labor while the latter rested and to have no other will than theirs and from this idea of a natural subordination among men sprang domesticity which voluntarily accepted at first was imperceptibly converted into horrible slavery time making this error more palpable has brought about justice nations have learned at their own cost that the subjection of man to man is a false idea an erroneous theory pernicious alike to master and to slave and yet such a social system has stood several thousand years and has been defended by celebrated philosophers even today under somewhat mitigated forms sophists of a every description uphold and extol it but experience is bringing it to an end time then is the criterion of societies thus looked at history is the demonstration of the errors of humanity by the argument reducto ad absurdum now the criterion sought for by metaphysicians would have the advantage of discriminating at once between the true and the false in every opinion so that in politics religion and morals for example the true and the useful being immediately recognized we should no longer need to await the sorrowful experience of time evidently such a secret would be death to the sophists that cursed brood who under different names excite the curiosity of nations and owing to the difficulty of separating the truth from the error in their artistically woven theories lead them into fatal ventures disturb their peace and fill them with such extraordinary prejudice up to this day the criterion of certainty remains a mystery this is owing to the multitude of criteria that have been successfully proposed some have taken for an absolute and definite criterion the testimony of the senses others intuition these evidence those argument m lemonus affirms that there is no other criterion than universal reason before him m de bonald thought he had discovered it in language 
quite recently n boucher has proposed morality and to harmonize them all the eclectics have said that it was absurd to seek for an absolute criterion since there were as many criteria as special orders of knowledge of all these hypotheses it may be observed that the testimony of the senses is not a criterion because the senses relating us only to phenomena furnish us with no ideas that intuition needs external confirmation or objective certainty that evidence requires proof and argument verification that universal reason has been wronged many a time that language serves equally well to express the true or the false that morality like all the rest needs demonstration and rule and finally that the eclectic idea is the least reasonable of all since it is of no use to say that there are several criteria if we cannot point out one i very much fear that it will be with a criterion as with the philosopher's stone that it will finally be abandoned not only as insolvable but as chimerical consequently i entertain no hopes of having found it nevertheless i am not sure that some one more skilful will not discover it be it as it may with regard to a criterion or criteria there are methods of demonstration which when applied to certain subjects may lead to the discovery of unknown truths bring to light relations hitherto unsuspected and lift a paradox to the highest degree of certainty in such a case it is not by its novelty nor even by its content that a system should be judged but by its method the critic then should follow the example of the supreme court which in the cases which come before it never examines the facts but only the form of procedure now what is the form of procedure a method i then looked to see what philosophy in the absence of a criterion had accomplished by the aid of special methods and i must say that i could not discover in spite of the loudly proclaimed pretensions of some that it had produced anything of real value and at last wearied with the philosophical twaddle i resolved to make a new search for the criterion i confess it to my shame this folly lasted for two years and i am not yet entirely rid of it it was like seeing a needle in a haystack i might have learned chinese or arabic in the time that i have lost in considering and reconsidering syllogisms in rising to the summit of an induction as to the top of a ladder in inserting a proposition between the horns of a dilemma in decomposing distinguishing separating denying affirming admitting as if i could pass abstractions through a sieve i selected justice as the subject matter of my experiments finally after a thousand decompositions recompositions and double compositions i found at the bottom of my analytical crucible not the criterion of certainty but a metaphysico economico political treatise whose conclusions were such that i did not care to present them in a more artistic or if you will more intelligible form the effect which this work produced upon all classes of minds gave me an idea of the spirit of our age and did not cause me to regret the prudent and scientific absurdity of my style how happens it to-day i am obliged to defend my intentions when my conduct bears the evident impress of such lofty morality you have read my work sir and you know the gist of my tedious and scholastic lucubrations considering the revolutions of humanity the vicissitudes of empires the transformations of property and the innumerable forms of justice and of right i asked are the evils which afflict us inherent in our condition as man or do they arise only from an error this inequality of fortunes which all admit to be the cause of society's embarrassments is it as some assert the effect of nature or in the division of the products of labour and the soil may there not have been some error in calculation does each labourer receive all that is due him and only that which is due him in short in the present conditions of labour wages and exchange is no one wronged are the accounts well kept is the social balance accurate then i commenced the most laborious investigation 
it was necessary to arrange informal notes to discuss contradictory titles to reply to capricious allegations to refute absurd pretensions and to describe fictitious debts dishonest transactions and fraudulent accounts in order to triumph over quibblers i had to deny the authority of custom to examine the arguments of legislators and to oppose science with science itself finally all these operations completed i had to give a judicial decision i therefore declared my hand upon my heart before god and men that the causes of social inequality are three in number one gratuitous appropriation of collective wealth two inequality in exchange three the right of profit or increase and since this threefold method of extortion is the very essence of the domain of property i denied the legitimacy of property and proclaimed its identity with robbery that is my only offence i have reasoned upon property i have searched for the criterion of justice i have demonstrated not the possibility but the necessity of equality of fortune i have allowed myself no attack upon persons no assault upon the government of which i more than any one else am a provisional adherent if i have sometimes used the word proprietor i have used it as the abstract name of a metaphysical being whose reality breathes in every individual not alone in a privileged few nevertheless i acknowledge for i wish my confession to be sincere that the general tone of my book has been bitterly censored they complain of an atmosphere of passion and invective unworthy of an honest man and quite out of place in the treatment of so grave a subject end of section thirty one conclusion part one Section 32 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Kirkby of Warwick, England. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government by Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Conclusion part two if this reproach is well founded at which it is impossible for me either to deny or admit because in my own cause i cannot be judge if i say i deserve this charge i can only humble myself and acknowledge myself guilty of an involuntary wrong the only excuse that i could offer being of such a nature that it ought not to be communicated to the public all that i can say is that i understand better than any one how the anger which injustice causes may render an author harsh and violent in his criticisms when after twenty years of labour a man still finds himself on the brink of starvation and then suddenly discovers an equivocation an error in calculation the cause of the evil which torments him in common with so many millions of his fellows he can scarcely restrain a cry of sorrow and dismay but sir though pride be offended by my rudeness it is not to pride that i apologize but to the proletaries to the simple-minded whom i perhaps have scandalized my angry dialects may have produced a bad effect on some peaceable minds some poor workmen more affected by my sarcasm than by the strength of my arguments may perhaps have concluded that property is the result of a perpetual machiavellianism on the part of the governors against the governed a deplorable error of which my book itself is the best refutation i devoted two chapters to showing how property springs from human personality and the comparison of individuals then i explained its perpetual limitation and following out the same idea i predicted its approaching disappearance 
How then could the editors of the Revue Democratique, after having borrowed from me nearly the whole substance of their economical articles, dare to say the holders of the soil and other productive capital are more or less willful accomplices in a vast robbery, they being the exclusive receivers and sharers of the stolen goods? The proprietors, willfully guilty of the crime of robbery, never did that homicidal phrase escape my pen never did my heart conceive the frightful thought thank heaven i know not how to calumniate my kind i have too strong a desire to seek for the reason of things to be willing to believe in criminal conspiracies the millionaire is no more tainted by property than the journeyman who works for thirty sous per day on both sides the error is equal as well as the intention the effect is also the same, though positive in the former and negative in the latter. I accuse property, I did not denounce the proprietors, which would have been absurd, and I am sorry that there are among us wills so perverse and minds so shattered that they care only for such of the truth as will aid them in their evil designs. Such is the only regret which I feel on account of my indignation, which, though expressed perhaps too bitterly, was at least honest and legitimate in its source. However, what did I do in this essay, which I voluntarily submitted to the Academy of Moral Sciences? Seeking a fixed axiom amid social uncertainties, I traced back to one fundamental question all the secondary questions over which, at present, so keen and diversified, a conflict is raging. This question was the right of property, then comparing all existing theories with each other and extracting from them that which is common to them all, I endeavoured to discover that element in the idea of property which is necessary, immutable and absolute, and asserted after authentic verification that this idea is reducible to that of individual and transmissible possession susceptible of exchange but not of alienation founded on labor and not on fictitious occupancy or idle caprice i said further that this idea was the result of our revolutionary movements the culminating point towards which all opinions gradually divesting themselves of their contradictory elements converge and i tried to demonstrate this by the spirit of the laws by political economy by psychology and history a father of the church finishing a learned exposition of the catholic doctrine cried in the enthusiasm of his faith domini sir er est et decepti sumus if my religion is false god is to blame i as well as this theologian can say if equality is a fable god through whom we act and think and are god who governs society by eternal laws who rewards just nations and punishes proprietors god alone is the author of evil god has lied the fault lies not with me but if i am mistaken in my inferences i should be shown my error and led out of it it is surely worth a trouble and i think i deserve this honour there is no ground for prescription for in the words of that member of the convention who did not like the guillotine to kill is not to reply until then i persist in regarding my work as useful social full of instruction for public officials worthy in short of reward and encouragement for there is one truth of which i am profoundly convinced nations live by absolute ideas not by approximate and partial conceptions therefore men are needed who define principles or at least test them in the fire of controversy such is the law the idea first the pure idea the understanding of the laws of god the theory practice follows with slow steps cautious attentive to the succession of events sure to seize towards this eternal meridian the indications of supreme reason the cooperation of theory and practice produces in humanity the realization of order the absolute truth footnote 
a writer for the radical press m louis rabond said in the preface to his studies of contemporary reformers who does not know that morality is relative aside from a few grand sentiments which are strikingly instinctive the measure of human acts varies with nations and climates and only civilization the progressive education of the race can lead to a universal morality the absolute escapes our contingent and finite nature the absolute is the secret of god god keep me from evil m louis rabond but i cannot help remarking that all political apostates begin by the negation of the absolute which is really the negation of truth what can a writer who professes scepticism have in common with radical views what has he to say to his readers what judgment is he entitled to pass upon contemporary reformers m Rabon thought it would seem wise to repeat an old impertinence of the logist and that may serve him for an excuse we all have these weaknesses but i am surprised that a man of so much intelligence as m Rabond, who studies systems fails to see the very thing he ought first to recognize namely that systems are the progress of the mind towards the absolute End of footnote. all of us as long as we live are called each in proportion to his strength to his sublime work the only duty which it imposes upon us is to refrain from appropriating the truth to ourselves either by concealing it or by accommodating it to the temper of the century or by using it for our own interests this principle of conscience so grand and so simple has always been present in my thought consider in fact sir that which i might have done but did not wish to do i reason on the most honourable hypothesis what hindered me from concealing for some years to come the abstract theory of the equality of fortunes and at the same time from criticising constitutions and codes from showing the absolute and the contingent the immutable and the ephemeral the eternal and the transitory in laws present and past from constructing a new system of legislation and establishing on a solid foundation this social edifice ever destroyed and as often rebuilt might i not taking up the definitions of casuists have clearly shown the cause of their contradictions and uncertainties and supplied at the same time the inadequacies of their conclusions might i not have confirmed this labour by a vast historical exposition in which the principle of exclusion and of the accumulation of property the appropriation of collective wealth and the radical vice in exchanges would have figured as the constant causes of tyranny war and revolution it should have been done you say do not doubt sir that such a task would have required more patience than genius with the principles of social economy which i have analyzed i would have only to break the ground and follow the furrow the critic of laws finds nothing more difficult than to determine justice the labor alone would have been longer oh if i had pursued this glittering prospect unlike the man of the burning bush with inspired countenance and deep and solemn voice had presented myself some day with new tables there would have been found fools to admire boobies to applaud and cowards to offer me the dictatorship for in the way of popular infatuations nothing is impossible but sir after this monument of insolence and pride what should i have deserved in your opinion at the tribunal of god and in the judgment of free men death sir and eternal reprobation i therefore spoke the truth as soon as i saw it waiting only long enough to give it proper expression i pointed out error in order that each might reform himself and render his labours more useful i announced the existence of a new political element in order that my associates in reform developing it in concert might arrive more promptly at that unity of principles which alone can assure to society a better day i expected to receive if not from my book at least for my commendable conduct a small republican ovation and behold journalists denounce me academics curse me political adventurers great god think to make themselves tolerable by protesting that they are not like me 
I give the formula by which the whole social edifice may be scientifically reconstructed, and the strongest minds reproach me for being able only to destroy. The rest despise me, because I am unknown. When the essay on property fell into the reformatory camp, some asked, Who has spoken? Is it Arago? Is it Lamanas? Michael de Bourges? Or Garnier Pages? And when they heard the name of a new man, we do not know him, they would reply. Thus the monopoly of thought, property in reason, oppresses the proletariat as well as the bourgeoisie. The worship of the infamous prevails even on the steps of the tabernacle. But what am I saying? May evil befall me if I blame the poor creatures. Oh, let us not despise those generous souls who in the excitement of their patriotism are always prompt to identify the voice of their chiefs with the truth. Let us encourage rather their simple credulity, enlighten complacently and tenderly their precious sincerity, and reserve our shafts for those vain glorious spirits who are always admiring their genius, and in different tongues caressing the people in order to govern them. These considerations alone oblige me to reply to the strange and superficial conclusions of the Journal du Peuple, issue of October 11, 1840, on the question of property. I leave, therefore, the journalist to address myself only to his readers. I hope that the self-love of the writer will not be offended if, in the presence of the masses, I ignore an individual. You say, proletaries of the people, for the very reason that men and things exist, there always will be men who will possess things, nothing therefore can destroy property. In speaking thus, you unconsciously argue exactly after the manner of M. Cousin, who always reasons from possession to property. This coincidence, however, does not surprise me. M. Cousin is a philosopher of much mind, and you, proletaries, have still more. Certainly it is honourable, even for a philosopher, to be your companion in error. Originally, the word property was synonymous with proper or individual possession. It designated each individual's special right to the use of a thing. But when this right of use, inert, if I may say so, as it was with regard to other usufructories, became active and paramount, that is, when the usufructory converted his right to personally use the thing to the right to use it by his neighbor's labor, then property changed its nature, and its idea became complex. The legists knew this very well, but instead of opposing, as they ought, this accumulation of profits, they accepted and sanctioned the whole, and as the right of farm rent necessarily implies the right of use, in other words, as the right to cultivate land by the labour of a slave supposes one's power to cultivate it himself, according to the principle that the greater includes the less. The name property was reserved to designate this double right, and that of possession was adopted to designate the right of use. Whence property came to be called the perfect right, the right of domain, the eminent right, the heroic or queritory right, in Latin jus perfectum, jus optimum, jus queritarium, jus domini, while possession became assimilated to farm rent. Now that individual possession exists of right, or better, from natural necessity, all philosophers admit and can easily be demonstrated, but when, in imitation of M. Cousin, we assume it to be the basis of the domain of property, we fall into the sophism, called sophisma amphibile vel ambiguatus, which consists in changing the meaning by a verbal equivocation. People often think themselves very profound, because by the aid of expressions of extreme generality they appear to rise to the height of absolute ideas, and thus deceive inexperienced minds. And what is worse, this is commonly called examining abstractions, but the abstraction formed by the comparison of identical facts is one thing, while that which is deduced from different exceptions of the same term is quite another. The first gives the universal idea, the axiom, the law, the second indicates the order of generation of ideas. All our errors arise from the constant confusion of these two kinds of abstractions, in this particular languages and philosophies are alike deficient. 
the less common an idiom is and the more obscure its terms the more prolific is it as a source of error a philosopher is sophistical in proportion to his ignorance of any method of neutralizing this imperfection in language if the art of correcting the errors of speech by scientific methods is ever discovered then philosophy will have found its criterion of certainty now then the difference between property and possession being well established and it being settled that the former for the reasons which i have just given must necessarily disappear is it best for the slight advantage of restoring an etymology to retain the word property my opinion is that it would be very unwise to do so and i will tell you why i quote from the journal de people to the legislative power belongs the right to regulate property to prescribe the conditions of acquiring possessing and transmitting it it cannot be denied that inheritance assessment commerce industry labor and wages require the most important modifications you wish proletaries to regulate property that is you wish to destroy it and reduce it to the right of possession for to regulate property without the consent of the proprietors is to deny the right of domain to associate employees with proprietors is to destroy the eminent right to suppress or even reduce farm rent house rent revenue and increase generally is to annihilate perfect property why then while laboring with such laudable enthusiasm for the establishment of equality should you retain an expression whose equivocal meaning will always be an obstacle in the way of your success there you have the first reason a wholly philosophical one for rejecting not only a thing but the name property here now is the political the highest reason every social revolution m cousin will tell you is affected only by the realization of an idea either political moral or religious when alexander conquered asia his idea was to avenge greek liberty against the insults of oriental despotism when marius and caesar overthrew the roman patricians their idea was to give bread to the people when christianity revolutionized the world its idea was to emancipate mankind and to substitute the worship of one god for the deities of epicurus and homer when france rose in eighty nine her idea was liberty and equality before the law there has been no true revolution says m cousin without its idea so that where an idea does not exist or even fails of a formal expression revolution is impossible there are mobs conspirators rioters regicides there are no revolutionists society devoid of ideas twists and tosses about and dies in the midst of its fruitless labor nevertheless you all feel that a revolution is to come and that you alone can accomplish it what then is the idea which governs you proletaries of the nineteenth century for really i cannot call you revolutionists what do you think what do you believe what do you want be guarded in your reply i have read faithfully your favorite journals your most esteemed authors i find everywhere only vain and puerile entites nowhere do i discover an idea I will explain the meaning of this word entite, new without doubt to most of you. By entite is generally understood a substance which the imagination grasps, but which is incognizable by the senses and the reason, thus the soporific power of opium of which scanarelli speaks and the piquant humours of ancient medicines are entites the entite is the support of those who do not wish to confess their ignorance it is incomprehensible or as st paul says the argumentum non apparentium in philosophy the entite is often only a repetition of words which add nothing to the thought for example when m pierre Leroux, who says so many excellent things but who is too fond in my opinion of his platonic formulas assures us that the evils of humanity are due to our ignorance of life m pierre Leroux utters an entite for it is evident that if we are evil it is because we do not know how to live but the knowledge of this fact is of no value to us when m edgar quinet declares that france suffers and declines because there is an antagonism of men and of interests he declares an entite for the problem is to discover the cause of this antagonism 
when m lamanas in thunder tones preaches self-sacrifice and love he proclaims two entites for we need to know on what conditions self-sacrifice and love can spring up and exist so also proletaries when you talk of liberty progress and the sovereignty of the people you make of these naturally intelligible things so many entites in space for on the one hand we need a new definition of liberty since that of eighty nine no longer suffices and on the other we must know in what direction society should proceed in order to be in progress as for the sovereignty of the people that is a grosser entite than the sovereignty of reason it is the entite of entite in fact since sovereignty can no more be conceived of outside of the people than outside of reason it remains to be ascertained who among the people shall exercise the sovereignty and among so many minds which shall be the sovereigns to say that the people should elect their representatives is to say that the people should recognize their sovereigns which does not remove the difficulty at all but suppose that equal by birth equal before the law equal in personality equal in social functions you wish also to be equal in conditions suppose that perceiving all the mutual relations of men whether they produce or exchange or consume to be the relations of commutative justice in a word social relations suppose i say that perceiving this you wish to give this natural society a legal existence and to establish the fact by law i say that then you need a clear positive and exact expression of your whole idea that is an expression which states at once the principle the means and the end and i add that this expression is association and since the association of the human race dates at least rightfully from the beginning of the world and has gradually established and perfected itself by successively divesting itself of its negative elements slavery nobility despotism aristocracy and feudalism i say that to eliminate the last negation of society to formulate the last revolutionary idea you must change your old rallying cries no more absolutism no more nobility no more slaves into that of no more property but i know what astonishes you poor souls blasted by the wind of poverty and crushed by your patron's pride it is equality whose consequences frighten you how you have said in your journal how can we dream of a level which being unnatural is therefore unjust how shall we pay the day's labor of a cominin or a laminas plebeians listen when after the battle of salamis the athenians assembled toward the prizes for courage after the ballots had been collected it was found that each combatant had one vote for the first prize and the themistocles all the votes for the second the people of minerva were crowned by their own hands truly heroic souls all were worthy of the olive branch since all had ventured to claim it for themselves antiquity praised this sublime spirit learn proletaries to esteem yourselves and to respect your dignity you wish to be free and you know not how to be citizens now whoever says citizens necessarily says equals if i should call myself lamanas or cominin and some journal speaking of me should burst forth with these hyperboles incomparable genius superior mind consummate virtue noble character i should not like it and should complain first because such eulogies are never deserved and second because they furnish a bad example but i wish in order to reconcile you to equality to measure for you the greatest literary personage of our century do not accuse me of envy proletaries if i a defender of equality estimate at their proper value talents which are universally admired and which i better than any one know how to recognize a dwarf can always measure a giant all that he needs is a yardstick you have seen the pretentious announcements of pasquis un philosophy and you have admired the work on trust for either you have not read it or if you have you are incapable of judging it acquaint yourselves then with this speculation more brilliant than sound and while admiring the enthusiasm of the author cease to pity those useful labors which only habit and the great number of the persons engaged in them render contemptible i shall be brief 
for notwithstanding the importance of the subject and the genius of the author what i have to say is of but little moment m lamanas starts with the existence of god how does he demonstrate it by cicero's argument that is by the consent of the human race there is nothing new in that we have still to find out whether the belief of the human race is legitimate or as can says whether our subjective certainty of the existence of god corresponds with the objective truth this however does not trouble m lamanas he says that if the human race believes it is because it has a reason for believing then having pronounced the name of god m lamanas sings a hymn and that is his demonstration the first hypothesis admitted m lamanas follows it with the second namely that there are three persons in god but while christianity teaches the dogma of the trinity only on the authority of revelation m lamanas pretends to arrive at it by the sole force of argument and he does not perceive that his pretended demonstration is from beginning to end anthropomorphism that is an ascription of the faculties of the human mind and the powers of nature to the divine substance new songs new hymns god and the trinity thus demonstrated the philosopher passes to the creation a third hypothesis in which m lamanas always eloquent varied and sublime demonstrates that god made the world neither of nothing nor of something nor of himself that he was free in creating but that nevertheless he could not but create that there is in matter a matter which is not matter that the archetypal ideas of the world are separated from each other in the divine mind by a division which is obscure and unintelligible and yet substantial and real which involves intelligibility we meet with like contradictions concerning the origin of evil to explain this problem one of the profoundest in philosophy m lamanas at one time denies evil at another makes god the author of evil and at still another seeks outside of god a first cause which is not god an amalgam of entites more or less incoherent borrowed from plato proclus spinoza i might say even from all philosophers having thus established his trinity of hypotheses m lamanas deduces therefrom by a badly connected chain of analogies his whole philosophy and it is here especially that we notice the syncretism which is peculiar to him the theory of m lamanas embraces all systems and supports all opinions are you a materialist suppress as useless entites the three persons in god then starting directly from heat light and electromagnetism which according to the author are the three original fluids the three primary external manifestations of will intelligence and love you have a materialistic and aesthetic cosmogony on the contrary you are wedded to spiritualism with the theory of the immateriality of the body you are able to see everywhere nothing but spirits finally if you incline to pantheism you will be satisfied by m lamanas who formally teaches that the world is not an emanation from divinity which is pure pantheism but a flow of divinity i do not pretend however to deny that pasquis contains some excellent things but by the author's declaration these things are not original with him it is the system which is his that is undoubtedly the reason why m lamanas speaks so contemptuously of his predecessors in philosophy and disdains to quote his originals he thinks that since pasquis contains all true philosophy the world will lose nothing when the names and the works of the old philosophers perish m lamanas who renders glory to god in beautiful songs does not know how as well to render justice to his fellows his fatal fault is this appropriation of knowledge which the theologians call the philosophical sin or the sin against the holy ghost a sin which will not damn you proletaries nor me either in short pasquis judged as a system and divested of all which its author borrows from previous systems is a commonplace work whose method consists in constantly explaining the known by the unknown and in giving entites for abstractions and tautologies for proofs its whole 
theodicy is a work not of genius but of imagination a patching up of neo-platonic ideas the psychological portion amounts to nothing m lamanas openly ridiculing labors of this character without which however metaphysics is impossible the book which treats of logic and its methods is weak vague and shallow finally we find in the physical and the physiological speculations which m lamanas deduces from his trinitarian cosmogony grave errors the preconceived design of accommodating facts to theory and the substitution in almost every case of hypothesis for reality the third volume on industry and art is the most interesting to read and the best it is true that m lamanas can boast of nothing but his style as a philosopher he has added not a single idea to those which existed before him why then this excessive mediocrity of m lamanas considered as a thinker a mediocrity which disclosed itself at the time of the publication of the essai sur la indifference it is because remember this well proletaries nature makes no man truly complete and because the development of certain faculties almost always excludes an equal development of the opposite faculties it is because m lamanas is preeminently a poet a man of feeling and sentiment look at his style exuberant sonorous picturesque vehement full of exaggeration and invective and hold it for certain that no man possessed of such a style was ever a true metaphysician this wealth of expression and illustration which everybody admires becomes in m lamanas the incurable cause of his philosophical impotence his flow of language and his sensitive nature misleading his imagination he thinks that he is reasoning when he is only repeating himself and readily takes a description for a logical deduction hence his horror of positive ideas his feeble powers of analysis his pronounced taste for indefinite analogies verbal abstractions hypothetical generalities in short all sort of entites further the entire life of m namanas is conclusive proof of his anti-philosophical genius devout even to mysticism an ardent ultramontane an intolerant theocrat he at first feels the double influence of the religious reaction and the literary theories which marked the beginning of this century and falls back to the middle ages and gregory the seventh then suddenly becoming a progressive christian and a democrat he gradually leans towards rationalism and finds finally falls into deism at present everybody waits at the trap-door as for me though i would not swear to it i am inclined to think that m lamanas already taken with scepticism will die in a state of indifference he owes to individual reason and methodical doubt this expiation of his early essays it has been pretended that m lamanas preaching now a theocracy now universal democracy has been always consistent that under different names he has sought invariably one and the same thing unity pitiful excuse for an author surprised in the very act of contradiction what would be thought of a man who by turns a servant of despotism under louis the sixteenth a demagogue with robespierre a courtier of the emperor a bigot during fifteen years of the restoration a conservative since eighteen thirty should dare to say that he ever had wished for but one thing public order would he be regarded as any the less of a renegade from all parties public order unity the world's welfare social harmony the union of the nations concerning each of these things there is no possible difference of opinion everybody wishes them the character of the publicist depends only upon the means by which he proposes to arrive at them but why look to m lamanas for a steadfastness of opinion which he himself repudiates has he not said the mind has no law that which i believe to-day i did not believe yesterday i do not know that i shall believe it to-morrow 
No, there is no real superiority among men, since all talents and capacities are combined never in one individual. This man has the power of thought, that one imagination and style, still another industrial and commercial capacity. By our very nature and education we possess only special aptitudes which are limited and confined, and which become consequently more necessary as they gain in depth and strength capacities are to each other as functions and persons who would dare to classify them in ranks the finest genius is by the laws of his existence and development the most dependent upon the society which creates him who would dare to make a god of the glorious child it is not strength which makes the man said a hercules of the market-place the admiring crowd it is character that man who had only his muscles held force in contempt the lesson is a good one proletaries we should profit by it it is not talent which is also a force it is not knowledge it is not beauty which makes the man it is heart courage will virtue now if we are equal in that which makes us men how can the accidental distribution of secondary faculties detract from our manhood Remember that privilege is naturally and inevitably the lot of the weak, and do not be misled by the fame which accompanies certain talents, whose greatest merit consists in their rarity and a long and toilsome apprenticeship. It is easier for M. Lamanas to recite a philippic, or sing a humanitarian ode after the platonic fashion, than to discover a single useful truth. It is easier for an economist to apply the laws of production and distribution than to write ten lines in the style of M. Lamanas. It is easier for both to speak than to act. You, then, who put your hands to the work, who alone truly create, why do you wish me to admit your inferiority? But what am I saying? yes you are inferior for you lack virtue and will ready for labor and for battle you have when liberty and equality are in question neither courage nor character end of section thirty two conclusion part two recording by edward kirkby of warwick england Section 33 of What is Property? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. What is Property? An Inquiry into the Principle of Right and of Government. By Pierre Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker. Conclusion Part Three. In the preface to this pamphlet on la paix et le gouvernement, as well as in his defence before the jury, M. Lamennais frankly declared himself an advocate of property. Out of regard for the author and his misfortune, I shall abstain from characterizing this declaration and from examining those two sorrowful performances. M. Lamennais seems to be only the tool of a quasi-radical party, which flatters him in order to use him, without respect for a glorious but henceforth powerless old age. What means this profession of faith, from the first number of Le Vignier to Esquisse d'une Philosophie? M. Lamennais always favours equality, association, and even a sort of vague and indefinite communism. M. Lamennais, in recognizing the right of property, gives the lie to his past career, and renounces his most generous tendencies. Can it then be true that in this man, who has been too roughly treated, but who is also too easily flattered, strength of talent has already outlived strength of will? It is said that M. Lamennais has rejected the offers of several of his friends to try to procure for him a commutation of his sentence. M. Lamennais prefers to serve out his time. May not this affection of a false stoicism come from the same source as his recognition of the right of property? The Huron, when taken prisoner, hurls insults and threats at his conqueror. That is the heroism of the savage. 
the martyr prays for his executioners and is willing to receive from them his life that is the heroism of the christian why has the apostle of love become an apostle of anger and revenge has then the translator of la imitation forgotten that he who offends charity cannot honor virtue galileo retracting on his knees before the tribunal of his inquisition his heresy in regard to the movement of the earth and recovering at that price his liberty seems to me a hundred times grander than m lamennais what if we suffer for truth and justice must we in retaliation thrust our persecutors outside the pale of human society and when sentenced to an unjust punishment must we decline exemption if it is offered to us because it pleases a few base satellites to call it a pardon such is not the wisdom of christianity but i forgot that in the presence of m lamennais this name is no longer pronounced may the prophet of lavinier be soon restored to liberty and his friends but above all may he henceforth derive his inspiration only from his genius and his heart o oh, proletaries proletaries how long are you to be victimized by this spirit of revenge and implacable hatred which your false friends kindle and which perhaps has done more harm to the development of reformatory ideas than the corruption ignorance and malice of the government believe me at the present time everybody is to blame in fact in intention or in example all are found wanting and you have no right to excuse any one the king himself god forgive me i do not like to justify a king the king himself is like his predecessors only the personification of an idea and an idea proletaries which possesses you yet his greatest wrong consists in wishing for its complete realization while you wish it realized only partially consequently in being logical in his government while you in your complaints are not at all so you clamour for a second regicide he that is without sin among you let him cast at the prince of property the first stone how successful you would have been if in order to influence men you had appealed to the self-love of men if in order to alter the constitution and the law you had placed yourselves within the constitution and the law fifty thousand laws they say make up our political and civil codes of these fifty thousand laws twenty-five thousand are for you twenty-five thousand against you is it not clear that your duty is to oppose the former to the latter and thus by the argument of contradiction drive privilege into its last ditch this method of action is henceforth the only useful one being the only moral and rational one for my part if i had the ear of this nation to which i am attached by birth and predilection with no intention of playing the leading part in the future republic i would instruct the laboring masses to conquer property through institutions and judicial pleadings to seek auxiliaries and accomplices in the highest ranks of society and to ruin or privileged classes by taking advantage of their common desire for power and popularity the petition for the electoral reform has already received two hundred thousand signatures and the illustrious arago threatens us with a million surely that will be well done but from this million of citizens who are as willing to vote for an emperor as for equality could we not select ten thousand signatures i mean bona fide signatures whose authors can read write cipher and even think a little and whom we could invite after due perusal and verbal explanation to sign such a petition as the following to his excellency the minister of the interior monsieur le minister on the day when a royal ordinance decreeing the establishment of model national workshops shall appear in the monetaire the undersigned to the number of ten thousand will repair to the palace of the tuileries and there with all the power of their lungs will shout long live louis philippe on the day when the moniteur shall inform the public that this petition is refused the undersigned to the number of ten thousand will say secretly in their hearts down with louis philippe if i am not mistaken such a petition would have some effect footnote the electoral reform 
it is continually asserted, is not an end, but a means. Undoubtedly, but what, then, is the end? Why not furnish an unequivocal explanation of its object? How can the people choose their representatives unless they know in advance the purpose for which they choose them, and the object of the commission which they entrust to them? But, it is said, the very business of those chosen by the people is to find out the object of the reform. That is a quibble. What is to hinder these persons, who are to be elected in future, from first seeking for this object, and then, when they have found it, from communicating it to the people? The reformers have well said that while the object of the electoral reform remains in the least indefinite, it will be only a means of transferring power from the hands of petty tyrants to the hands of other tyrants. We know already how a nation may be oppressed by being led to believe that it is obeying only its own laws. The history of universal suffrage among all nations is the history of the restrictions of liberty by and in the name of the multitude. Still, if the electoral reform in its present shape were rational, practical, acceptable to clean consciences and upright minds, perhaps one might be excused, though ignorant of its object for supporting it. But no, the text of the petition determines nothing, makes no distinctions, requires no conditions, no guarantee. It establishes the right without the duty. Every Frenchman is a voter, and eligible to office. As well say, every bayonet is intelligent, every savage is civilized, every slave is free. In its vague generality, the reformatory petition is the weakest of abstractions, or the highest form of political treason. Consequently, the enlightened patriots distrust and despise each other. The most radical writer of the time, he whose economical and social theories are, without comparison, the most advanced, M. Leroux has taken a bold stand against universal suffrage and democratic government and has written an exceedingly keen criticism of J. J. Rousseau. That is undoubtedly the reason why M. Leroux is no longer the philosopher of La Nationale. That journal, like Napoleon, does not like men of ideas. Nevertheless, La Nationale ought to know that he who fights against ideas will perish by ideas. End of footnote. The pleasure of a popular ovation would be well worth the sacrifice of a few millions. They sow so much to reap unpopularity. Then, if the nation, its hopes of 1830 restored, should feel its duty to keep its promise, and it would keep it, for the word of the nation is, like that of God, sacred. If, I say, the nation reconciled by this act with the public-spirited monarchy should bear to the foot of the throne its cheers and its vows, and should at that solemn moment choose me to speak in its name, the following would be the substance of my speech. Sire, this is what the nation wishes to say to your majesty. O king, you see what it costs to gain the applause of the citizens. Would you like us henceforth to take for our motto, Let us help the king, the king will help us. Do you wish the people to cry, The king and the French nation? Then abandon these grasping bankers, these quarrelsome lawyers, these miserable bourgeois, these infamous writers, these dishonoured men. All these, sire, hate you, and continue to support you only because they fear us. Finish the work of our kings, wipe out aristocracy and privilege, consult with these faithful proletaries, with the nation, which alone can honour a sovereign, and sincerely shout, Long live the king! The rest of what I have to say, sir, is for you alone. Others would not understand me. You are, I perceive, a Republican as well as an economist, and your patriotism revolts at the very idea of addressing to the authorities a petition in which the government of Louis-Philippe should be tacitly recognized. National workshops? It were well to have such institutions established, you think but patriotic hearts will never accept them from an aristocrat ministry, nor by the courtesy of a king. Already, undoubtedly, your old prejudices have returned, and you now regard me only as a sophist, 
as ready to flatter the powers that be as to dishonor by pushing them to an extreme the principles of equality and universal fraternity what shall i say to you that i should so lightly compromise the future of my theories either this clever sophistry which is attributed to me must be at bottom a very trifling affair or else my convictions must be so firm that they deprive me of free will but not to insist further on the necessity of a compromise between the executive power and the people it seems to me sir that in doubting my patriotism you reason very capriciously and that your judgments are exceedingly rash you sir ostensibly defending government and property are allowed to be a republican reformer phalansterian anything you wish i on the contrary demanding distinctly enough a slight reform in public economy am for ordained a conservative and likewise a friend of the dynasty i cannot explain myself more clearly so firm a believer am i in the philosophy of accomplished facts and the status quo of governmental forms that instead of destroying that which exists and beginning over again the past i prefer to render everything legitimate by correcting it it is true that the corrections which i propose though respecting the form tend to finally change the nature of the things corrected who denies it but it is precisely that which constitutes my system of status quo i make no war upon symbols figures or phantoms i respect scarecrows and bow before bugbears i ask on the one hand that property be left as it is but that interest on all kinds of capital be gradually lowered and finally abolished on the other hand that the charter be maintained in its present shape but that method be introduced into administration and politics that is all nevertheless submitting to all that is though not satisfied with it i endeavor to conform to the established order and to render unto caesar the things that are caesar's is it thought for instance that i love property very well i am myself a proprietor and do homage to the right of increase as is proved by the fact that i have creditors to whom i faithfully pay every year a large amount of interest the same with politics since we are monarchy i would cry long live the king rather than suffer death which does not prevent me however from demanding that the irremovable inviolable and hereditary representative of the nation shall act with the proletaries against the privileged classes in a word that the king shall become the leader of the radical party thereby we proletaries would gain everything and i am sure that at this price louis philippe might secure to his family the perpetual presidency of the republic and this is why i think so if there existed in france but one great functional inequality the duty of the functionary being from one end of the year to the other to hold full court of savants artists soldiers deputies inspectors it is evident that the expenses of the presidency then would be the national expenses and that through the reversion of the civil list to the mass of consumers the great inequality of which i speak would form an exact equation with the whole nation of this no economist needs a demonstration consequently there would be no more fear of cliques courtiers and appendages since no new inequality could be established the king as king would have friends unheard of thing but no family his relatives or kinsmen agne et cogne if they were fools would be nothing to him and in no case with the exception of heir apparent would they have even in court more privileges than others no more nepotism no more favor no more baseness no one would go to court save when duty required or when called by an honorable distinction and as all conditions would be equal and all functions equally honored there would be no other emulation than that of merit and virtue i wish the king of the french could say without shame my brother the gardener my sister-in-law the milkmaid my son the prince royal and my son the blacksmith his daughter might well be an artist that would be beautiful sir that would be royal no one but a buffoon could fail to understand it in this way i have come to think that the forms of royalty may be made to harmonize with the requirements of equality 
and have given a monarchical form to my republican spirit i have seen that france contains by no means as many democrats as is generally supposed and i have compromised with the monarchy i do not say however that if france wanted a republic i could not accommodate myself equally well and perhaps better by nature i hate all signs of distinction crosses of honor gold lace liveries costumes honorary titles and above all parades if i had my way no general should be distinguished from a soldier nor a peer of france from a peasant why have i never taken part in a review for i am happy to say sir that i am a national guard i have nothing else in the world but that because the review is always held at a place which i do not like and because they have fools for officers whom i am compelled to obey you see this is not the best of my history that in spite of my conservative opinions my life is a perpetual sacrifice to the republic nevertheless i doubt if such simplicity would be agreeable to french vanity to that inordinate love of distinction and flattery which makes our nation the most frivolous in the world monsieur lamentine in his grand meditation on bonaparte calls the french a nation of brutuses we are merely a nation of narcissuses previous to eighty nine we had the aristocracy of blood then every bourgeois looked down upon the commonality and wished to be a nobleman afterwards distinction was based on wealth and the bourgeoisie jealous of the nobility and proud of their money used eighteen thirty to promote not liberty by any means but the aristocracy of wealth when through the force of events and the natural laws of society for the development of which france offers such free play equality shall be established in functions and fortunes then the beau and the belle the savants and the artists will form new classes there is a universal and innate desire in this gallic country for fame and glory we must have distinctions be they what they may nobility wealth talent beauty or dress i suspect arrange and gonier page of having aristocratic manners and i picture to myself our great journalists in their columns so friendly to the people administering rough kicks to the compositors in their printing offices this man once said le national in speaking of Carrel, whom we had proclaimed first consul is it not true that the monarchical principle still lives in the hearts of our democrats and that they want universal suffrage in order to make themselves kings since la nationale prides itself on holding more fixed opinions than le journal de Dabas, i presume that amon carrel being dead monsieur amon maras is now first consul and monsieur garnier second consul in everything the deputy must give way to the journalist i do not speak of monsieur arago whom i believe to be in spite of calumny too learned for the consulship be it so though we have consuls our position is not much altered i am ready to yield my share of sovereignty to monsieur amon maras and garnier page the appointed consuls provided they will swear on entering upon the duties of their office to abolish property and not to be haughty forever promises forever oaths why should the people trust in tribunes when kings perjure themselves alas truth and honesty are no longer as in the days of king john in the mouth of princes a whole senate has been convicted of felony and the interest of the governors always being for some mysterious reason opposed to the interest of the governed parliaments follow each other while the nation dies of hunger no 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 more protectors no more emperors no more consuls better manage our affairs ourselves than through agents better associate our industries than beg from monopolies and since the republic cannot dispense with virtues we should labor for our reform this therefore is my line of conduct i preach emancipation to the proletaries association to the laborers equality to the wealthy i push forward the revolution by all means in my power the tongue the pen the press by action and example my life is a continual apostleship yes i am a reformer i say it as i think it in good faith 
and that I may be no longer reproached for my vanity. I wish to convert the world. Very likely this fancy springs from an enthusiastic pride, which may have turned to delirium, but it will be admitted at least that I have plenty of company, and that my madness is not monomania. At the present day everybody wishes to be reckoned among the lunatics of Beranger, to say nothing of the Bebeufs, the Marats, and the Robespierres, who swarm in our streets and workshops. All the great reformers of antiquity live again in the most illustrious personages of our time. One is Jesus Christ, another Moses, a third Mohammed. This is Orpheus, that Plato, or Pythagoras. Gregory the Seventh himself has risen from the grave together with the evangelists and the apostles, and it may turn out that even I am that slave who, having escaped from his master's house, was forthwith made a bishop and a reformer by St. Paul. As for the virgins and holy women, they are expected daily. At present we have only Aspasias and courtesans. Now, as in all diseases, their diagnostic varies according to the temperament, so my madness has its peculiar aspect and distinguishing characteristic. Reformers, as a general thing, are jealous of their role. They suffer no rivals, they want no partners, they have disciples, but no co-laborers. Tis my desire, on the contrary, to communicate my enthusiasm and to make it, as far as I can, epidemic. I wish that all were like myself, reformers in order that there might be no more sex, and that Christs, Antichrists, and false Christs might be forced to understand and agree with each other. Again, every reformer is a magician, or at least desires to become one. Thus Moses, Jesus Christ, and the Apostles proved their mission by miracles. Mohammed ridiculed miracles after having endeavoured to perform them. Fourier, more cunning, promises us wonders when the globe shall be covered with phalansteries. For myself, I have as great a horror of miracles as of authorities, and aim only at logic. That is why I continually search after the criterion of certainty. I work for the reformation of ideas. Little matters it that they find me dry and austere. I mean to conquer by a bold struggle, or die in the attempt and whoever shall come to the defence of property, I swear that I will force him to argue like Monsieur Considerant, or philosophise like Monsieur Troplon. Finally, and it is here that I differ most from my compeers, I do not believe it necessary, in order to reach equality, to turn everything topsy-turvy. To maintain that nothing but an overturn can lead to reform is, in my judgment, to construct a syllogism and to look for the truth in the regions of the unknown. Now I am for generalization, induction, and progress. I regard general disappropriation as impossible. Attacked from that point, the problem of universal association seems to me insolvable. Property is like the dragon which Hercules killed. To destroy it, it must be taken, not by the head, but by the tail, that is, by profit and interest. I stop. I have said enough to satisfy any one who can read and understand. The surest way by which the government can baffle intrigues and break up parties is to take possession of science, and point out to the nation, at an already appreciable distance, the rising oriflame of equality. To say to those politicians of the tribune and the press for whose fruitless quarrels we pay so dearly, you are rushing forward, blind as you are, to the abolition of property, but the government marches with its eyes open. You hasten the future by unprincipled and insincere controversy, but the government, which knows this future, leads you thither by a happy and peaceful transition. The present generation will not pass away before France. The guide and model of civilized nations has regained her rank and legitimate influence. But alas, the government itself, who shall enlighten it? Who can induce it to accept this doctrine of equality, whose terrible but decisive formula the most generous minds hardly dare to acknowledge? I feel my whole being tremble when I think that the testimony of three men, yes, of three men who make it their business to teach and define, would suffice to give full play to public opinion. 
to change beliefs and to fix destinies will not the three men be found may we hope or not what must we think of those who govern us in the world of sorrow in which the proletary moves and where nothing is known of the intentions of power it must be said that despair prevails but you sir you who by function belong to the official world you in whom the people recognize one of their noblest friends and property its most prudent adversary what say you of our deputies our ministers our king do you believe that the authorities are friendly to us then let the government declare its position let it print its profession of faith in equality and i am dumb otherwise i shall continue the war and the more obstinacy and malice is shown the oftener will i redouble my energy and audacity i have said before and i repeat it i have sworn not on the dagger and the death's head amid the horrors of a catacomb and in the presence of men besmeared with blood but i have sworn on my conscience to pursue property to grant it neither peace nor truce until i see it everywhere execrated i have not yet published half the things that i have to say concerning the right of domain nor the best things let the knights of property if there are any who fight otherwise than by retreating be prepared every day for a new demonstration and accusation let them enter the arena armed with reason and knowledge not wrapped up in sophisms for justice will be done to become enlightened we must have liberty that alone suffices but it must be the liberty to use the reason in regard to all public matters and yet we hear on every hand authorities of all kinds and degrees crying do not reason if a distinction is wanted here is one the public use of the reason always should be free but the private use ought always to be rigidly restricted by public use i mean the scientific literary use by private that which may be taken advantage of by civil officials and public functionaries since the governmental machinery must be kept in motion in order to preserve unity and attain our object we must not reason we must obey but the same individual who is bound from this point of view to passive obedience has the right to speak in his capacity of citizen and scholar he can make an appeal to the public submit it to his observations on events which occur around him and in the ranks above him taking care however to avoid offences which are punishable reason then as much as you like only obey kant fragment on the liberty of thought and of the press tissot's translation these words of the great philosopher outline for me my duty i have delayed the reprint of the work entitled what is property in order that i might lift the discussion to the philosophical height from which ridiculous clamour has dragged it down and that by a new presentation of the question i might dissipate the fears of good citizens i now re-enter upon the public use of my reason and give truth full swing the second edition of the first memoir on property will immediately follow the publication of this letter before issuing anything further i shall await the observations of my critics and the cooperation of the friends of the people and of equality hitherto i have spoken in my own name and on my own personal responsibility it was my duty i was endeavouring to call attention to principles which antiquity could not discover because it knew nothing of the signs which reveals them political economy i have then testified as to facts in short i have been a witness now my role changes it remains for me to deduce the practical consequences of the facts proclaimed the position of public prosecutor is the only one which i am henceforth fitted to fill and i shall sum up the case in the name of the people i am sir with all the consideration that i owe to your talent and your character your very humble and most obedient servant p j prodon pensioner of the academy of Besançon. P. S. During the session of April 2nd, the Chamber of Deputies rejected by a very large majority the Literary Property Bill, because it did not understand it. Nevertheless, literary property is only a special form of the right of property, which everybody claims to understand. Let us hope that this legislative president will not be fruitless for the cause of equality. The consequence of the vote of the Chamber is the abolition of capitalistic property 
property incomprehensible, contradictory, impossible, and absurd. End of section 33. Conclusion, part 3. Recording by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England. End of What is Property by Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. Translated by Benjamin R. Tucker.